You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Explore Paul's response to the divisive matters of the meats offered to idols and really just to try and highlight how relevant and helpful this is to ecclesial life today. Largely exhortational um, rather than expositional but uh, we're just going to pick out some of the, the, the important themes, the, the incredible themes that Paul highlights in chapter 8, 9 and 10 which are so helpful for our ecclesial life today. Uh, tomorrow we're going to do something which might be deemed to be a bit unusual to t- spend two sessions on looking at the first part of chapter 11, the, the subject of head coverings and head uncovering, uh, the principles and practice of that. So it might seem unusual uh, to take this up as a topic for a study weekend, but I hope that, hope that we actually find the two sessions tomorrow a refreshing exercise to renew our appreciation about what this unique script, section of scripture is about, and certainly to draw some helpful meaning and exhortation from it. I mean, as a group of people, we want to be doing things for good reason, don't we? We want, we want to be doing things for good, positive reason and purpose. We want to know what the Bible says and do it for good biblical reason. And so I hope tomorrow's discussions will assist with that uh, through those two sessions. And then on Sunday morning, I'm, I have to say I'm looking forward to it. We, we are dealing with a section of scripture, the second part of First Corinthians 11, which we know oh so well. Um, but we just want to tap back into the, the vital messages of that, that section and particularly hone in on that expression, what it is and what it means to discern the Lord's body which is so crucial if we are to partake of bread and wine worthily from week to week. What's it mean to discern the Lord's body? We're going to sort of try and tease that out on Sunday morning, God willing. So it's probably no secret, is it, that our ecclesias in these last days are under considerable pressure. There's probably many signs and symptoms to show this, and we don't really need to detail those tonight. It'd be true, wouldn't it, that the the age in which we live continues to present to us some very unique challenges, which which are perhaps different to challenges faced in former times. I might just give briefly just three examples of this. The first of these, these would be the obvious thing, the, the pandemic, which has been so disruptive to the sense of community that we have as brothers and sisters and as as ecclesias. When we had for a period of time Um, the the, the authorities telling us that we weren't allowed to assemble together or when we were able to come back together we were restricted in what we could do and we became very reliant on remote streaming. Well, I think most ecclesias have found and certainly we have up the hill that physical attendance at the meeting has not come roaring back now that the pandemic has wound back. And in some cases, because of caution and vulnerability, some brothers and sisters have hardly been sighted since the pandemic began. That's the reality. I would contend that our connectedness as members of an ecclesia, our sense of community has taken a significant hit because of the pandemic. And ecclesias across the globe are facing a major challenge with this. And while I think of that, just uh, if you get time, take time out to have a listen to a recent talk on good Christian, the Good Chris Elfin Talks podcast. A brother in Baltimore spoke about this as he's seeing it in his ecclesia way over there in the US, is precisely the same. It's it's the same syndrome, if you like, as as we're often experiencing here. And his words, I think, are well worth listening to. The pandemic. The second example I'd briefly mention is that in Australian secular society today, um, our society has never been, it has never been more cynical of the church. Attending a church is not trendy and the relevance of formal religion and committed involvement with the church is widely dismissed. The idea of spirituality isn't dismissed. Now, people still highlight and hold on to this idea of spirituality. It just has no reference point except an individual's personal belief, which is as valid as the next person's. By all means, we're here today, by all means, hold to your personal truth, but no need to tie yourself to an archaic and corrupt institution like a church or an ecclesia. And this inevitably impacts us, it does particularly the younger generation. And it would probably be a rare family that hasn't seen a family member 
adopt that kind of thinking or, or being disaffected in some way by this new age thinking. The third example I, I might mention, these, these unique challenges which are bringing pressure on our ecclesias. The third example would be, the, perhaps another obvious one, the phenomenon of social media. In our age, I think in a way which is different to all former ages, in our age, every matter of difference, every matter of contention that arises between brothers and sisters or between work colleagues, um, every matter of division seems to flare up disproportionately. It flares up disproportionately. Acrimony between individuals or work colleagues or political leaders or states or whatever it might be seems to flare up like a wildfire that rapidly escalates and spreads and often threatens to overwhelm, doesn't it? Just becomes this overwhelming thing and we wonder where on earth did that come from? How did it get to here? And it's often on the back of the use of social media. This is a feature of the modern age, I mean, it's well established. The free-for-all on social media platforms seem impossible to contain. Issues escalate out of control. Communities are soon polarised. Reconciliation and resolution between aggrieved parties soon seem an impossible course. Now this was seen in the, in the world, in the, in the Arab Spring. Remember the, the, the events of the Arab Spring which sort of just went like wildfire through the Arab countries. We, we, we sort of wonder how on earth did that happen? It happened on the back of the influence of social media, amongst other things. We see it in the terrible divide in the, in the society in the US. It's a terribly, terribly crippled society and social media plays into that time and time again. And we see it here in Australia at every, level, at every level on a daily basis. Of course, the ecclesia is not untouched by this phenomenon. We wouldn't expect it to be. We are affected by it. Issues arise between brothers and sisters or between groups of brothers and sisters or even between ecclesias. And because of the rapidly and poorly filtered social, social media commentary around it, they hit our community wave after wave, and we've seen it in the last 10 to 20 years, doing all sorts of damage unsettling the faith of some, causing young people to question whether this is the community for them to belong to. And you might think, well, this is a rather weighty and heavy way to start a study on a Friday evening, and, and so it is, brothers and sisters. It's a very negative kind of perspective to, to begin with. Why would we raise these examples? What's our point here? Well, when we weigh up these things, the, the three things we just brief, briefly mentioned, and many other factors which, which we could have mentioned, that are bringing so much pressure on our closure, on our sense of community, we can see why we all, brothers and sisters, all of us, need to strive all the harder under the hand, under the hand of God to pursue peace, to really pursue peace with each other, to pursue harmony and unity, to build cohesion and understanding amongst us. There is much to do, isn't there? There is much to do. And every single one of us needs to buy into it so that our children can experience a community that is attractive and positive and hopeful for the future, bound together in love, a safe place, a spiritual house that they want to belong to. Our children need to see this. And so the unbelievers who are yet not part of our community, they witness amongst us a, a cohesive, a connected community that truly reflects the love of Christ and is attractive to many who face a bleak outlook in this present world. Do you love your ecclesia, brothers and sisters? Do you love your ecclesia? Are you motivated to see it thrive, to grow, not just numerically, but to grow in fruitfulness, in bearing the fruits of the Spirit? Would you like to see your ecclesia pulling together with many brothers and sisters of diverse backgrounds, contributing to a rich fellowship of vibrant activity, praise and worship? Think of all the wonderful functions of an ecclesia. A young brother up the hill at our ecclesia just recently put this together, together with a, a bunch of supporting passages, and I just thought it was, it was a really handy list to put up. Just, just a reminder to us of, of all the, the various great functions that an ecclesia plays in our lives. It brings us together, doesn't it, for the breaking of bread on a regular basis, that, that sort of special and very intimate meeting that we share together, the, the, the height of our fellowship, if you like. It brings us together for praise and for prayer. The Ecclesia is a place where together we can have positive community impact as we, as we have outreach activities together. It brings us together for personal character development as we rub shoulders one with the other. Right? We learn to, to get on. We learn to get past our difficulties. 
we have a somewhat a, um, a moral compass as we, as we surround ourselves with other brothers and sisters who, who know about our life and have involvement in it. We're here together to hold fast to the truth, to the apostles' truth. We're here caring for the household of faith. We're here to develop the, the unity of the spirit, this, this incredible strong bond which binds us together, though we be so diverse and so different and come from so many different backgrounds. You know, without really spending any time on that whatsoever, we could say that the Ecclesia indeed is a special place, isn't it? It's a treasure in our life. And God would have every single one of us to play our part in its functioning, for its enrichment, for its strength and for its stability. And I'm talking to every single brother and sister here, whether you're older in years, whether you're younger in years, whether you're a family who has kids, whether you're a single brother and sister, all of us contributing to the cause. In these times of pressure that we're facing, the Ecclesia looks to you and it looks to me to bring the right spirit and the right mindset that's going to help the Ecclesia thrive. And it's really this mindset, we're going to use this word a few times, it's this mindset that I want to explore tonight, picking up some of the key ideas from 1 Corinthians 8 through to, through to chapter 10. Now, hopefully some of you were able to pre-read this in the, in the, in the uh, days uh, before tonight, uh, just to, I guess, refresh ourselves about some of the content, because we're really jumping into chapter 8, 9 and 10 cold tonight without having really read it. I know one brother certainly read it because he sent me an email about some of its content, so thank you for that. So we, we come back to chapter 8, and, and in these, in these um, chapters, um, Paul deals with the, the issue of meats offered to idols, doesn't he? And the verses that were read for us by Brother Aaron tonight are really Paul's concluding thoughts relating to this big issue affecting the Corinthian ecclesia, the dispute over whether a Christian should eat meat that has been offered to idols. He began, began talking about this in chapter 8, and he really concludes his comments uh, where we finish in the reading tonight. We're probably familiar with how it went. Most meat that was available in the city of Corinth would have had some connection to idolatry. Even meat that they purchased down at the market would likely have first been offered to idols in the pagan temples of the city. And certainly, meat that was available for consumption at the pagan temples, which was a very common place for people to go for social interaction, meat in those places, in the pagan temples, most certainly would first have been offered to the pagan gods before portions of the sacrificial meat were then made available for consumption by those who were visiting or by worshippers. For some ex-pagans who are now Christians, members of the Corinthian Ecclesia, for some of them, this connection between meat and idolatry, the idolatry that they used to engage in, was something that they just simply couldn't look past. They couldn't look past it. Paul styles them the weak, doesn't he? We have that expression there in chapter 8 and verse 7 verse 10, verse 11, and chapter 9, and verse 22. He styles them the weak. Now, this is not a disparaging or a derogatory term. Paul means that they have a very sensitive conscience. That's what he's talking about, a very sensitive conscience about meat, which dictated to them, dictated to them that, to treat meat, that they would treat meat with suspicion and they would avoid eating it. They would avoid eating the meat. So there'd be no waggy steaks for those who were the weak, under Paul's uh, um, comments here. So that's the weak on the one hand. But there's another way of viewing these same things. On the other hand, we have brothers and sisters who are labelled elsewhere as a strong. We find that, that label in Romans 15 verse 1, if you're looking for it. They're called the strong by Paul in that place. They saw it differently, didn't they? The same set of circumstances, but they saw it differently. With their new understanding of the one God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, they now rightly observed idols to be nothing. Idols were meaningless, powerless, images of wood and stone. And he's got some of this language there and some of that through verse 4, 5 and 6 of chapter 8. Meat offered to idols was still meat as far as these brothers and sisters were concerned. And meat, along with all other foods, was all part of God's gift to mankind, part of the Creator's gracious gift for humankind to consume. So because to this group, to the strong, meat was just meat, you know, whether it was offered to something or not, it's still meat, they were inclined to consume the meat from the markets. Or when they were invited out for a meal, they were inclined to eat the meat. Or even down at the temple precinct, some of them would eat the meat. 
There's no, no conscious issue for them. And so they would enjoy the Wagyu steak. Now, inevitably, and we can understand how this would happen, inevitably there's this friction between these two, two groups of people, the weak and the strong, as Paul stoles them. The strong have this tendency to despise the weak. They look down on them. They're tempted to look down on the weak and, and perhaps see them as silly, as spiritually immature or unlearned. The weak, on the other hand, they look at the strong, brother or sister, and they have this attitude towards them of, of judging them, or of condemning them. They condemn the strong as, as you're flirting with idolatry, you're unholy, perhaps worldly. Now, there's a lot going on in, in the Corinthian Ecclesia, and, and the book is 15 or 16 chapters long. But, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that, he, that Paul devotes so much of, of this epistle, chapter 8, 9 and 10, a consider, considerable section of his first epistle, he devotes to addressing how to resolve this particular dispute, highlighting the principles that should apply and showing how brothers and sisters could enjoy togetherness and oneness and a cohesive fellowship despite their differences. I think Paul's counsel in these chapters is tremendously important for us in our ecclesia today. And that's why you know, I sort of enjoy the opportunity to perhaps actually talk about it. I think it's really important for our ecclesia, for your ecclesia here. It's certainly important for the ecclesia I come from up at Mount Barker. We might be tempted to think, that, well, we look at 8, 9 and 10 here in Corinthians and think, well, there's, there's, no, there's no direct parallel to today. The meats offered to idol issue doesn't have particular relevance to us. We don't worship idols in pagan temples. The meat we might consume today as non-vegans has no connection to idolatry. Where's the relevance here? But when we think about it a little bit further, of course, it would be hard to argue that idolatry isn't alive and well in the 21st century and that we're all battling with it. What am I obsessed with? I've got to ask myself, what am I obsessed with? What is it that displaces God from the centre of my life? What do we prioritise ahead of God and the service of Christ? Well, it might be a number of things. It might just simply be me. I'm just consumed with everything about myself. God doesn't get a look in. Or it might be relationships, human relationships, that we put before our relationship with God. It might be sport. It could be money. It might be my all-important bucket list or leisure, or my pursuit of elite fitness, or entertainment, or my career, which is really taking me places. It might be gaming, it might be my hobby, it might be a host of other things, brothers and sisters. Now, this isn't a talk about idolatry, but would we concede that idolatry is a live temptation and we struggle with it every day? I would. Or if we look at the, the many issues that arise between brethren, matters of conscience, where there is no definitive commandment or directive from God. So God doesn't just give us a, a black and white commandment, you will do this and, and you won't do that. There's a lot of grey gray, gray matters, isn't there, in our, our discipleship, where we have to apply principle. Brothers and sisters have to sincerely apply biblical principle to such and such to work out what to do. What would be God honouring? I must apply a godly principle to a question of conduct with wisdom and discernment. And my fellow brother in the ecclesia, he does the same. But he arrives at a slightly different position to me. His conscience is different to mine. It's not wrong, it's just different. And the two of us have to get along harmoniously in the ecclesia. Well, there's many things, I think. There's many, many things that we could break it in this area in ecclesial life today. Matters of conscience where we differ where neither view is necessarily wrong or right, they are just different. And don't these matters create tension and division in ecclesias today? They do. They do. Let's be clear. Some examples. Formal dress-up meetings versus informal, neat and tidy dress-up meetings. The use of certain language in prayer, thee or thou, in prayer, as opposed to the use of more contemporary language, if you like, you and your in prayer when we're addressing the Father. The consumption of alcohol, particularly in the collective social settings. Worship styles are a common thing in this, in this area. Worship styles, hymns as opposed to songs, uh, keyboards versus other, other instruments like strings instruments, hymn books versus song books. 
Another matter of dress, the wearing of skirts or pants for women or girls at the ecclesia. The versions of the Bible, the use of the King James Version versus the use of other versions in the ecclesia. We have some people who have this leaning where they're sticklers for the rule of the constitution, the letter of the law. It must be obeyed in every single aspect. They're very, very um, conscious to, to, to follow the constitution in all of its detail to the very letter. Versus others who see some value in the constitution but believe that we're a spiritual house and we should more operate more by the spirit of the law. So certainly operate by the spirit of the constitution but they'd like to see some flexibility in ecclesial life, not just being, being um, I guess, hemmed in by a bunch of old rules in the constitution. You know, there's, 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 there's an axis there. There's, there's one thing versus the other, and this often creates tension within the ecclesia. You might have experienced that. Or this matter of the, the, the hall. You know, the, the, we've got this wonderful facility, this hall. This is the ecclesial hall. This is where the ecclesia should meet all together. We all need to come together and be in this place. And, of course, there's, that's a wonderful thing to do, and we, we do this all the time. But on the other hand, there's some who are really yearning for something that's more small, something that's smaller, something that's more intimate. They'd like to see more home gatherings where we split up into smaller groups and meet in those, those intimate settings. Sometimes creates tension where there's, there's differing views across that axis. Any of this sound familiar, brothers and sisters and young people? And there will be a heap of other examples that we could talk about. And I think that's because these things are common amongst us. This is why this section of 1 Corinthians is so important and relevant to us today. All these things in that time create tension and polarisation between brothers and sisters and even between ecclesias. But with the mindset that Paul encourages us to have, we can, we can navigate our, our way through these issues of conscience and continue to build and to energise our ecclesias and our strong sense of community. We can do this. We can overcome these things. But we all have to play a role in that. Every single one of us has to play a role. No matter your sex, no matter which generation you belong to, no matter what your surname is. So let's pick up some of the key ideas uh, from chapter 10, verse 23, through to chapter 11, verse 1, which was read for us tonight, if you turn over to there. So we began in verse 23. So this is his, basically his concluding comments on this section. All things are lawful for me, 10, verse 23, but all things are not expedient, he says. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Twice there he says, all things are lawful for me. As it happens, Paul's conscience would fall on the side of the strong. That's where he would sit. Where it's simply a matter of his own conscience, if Paul was just an, a, an island or a rock on his own, he would eat meat in Corinth without any feeling of guilt or shame. That's where his personal conscience lay. He would eat meat without any feeling of guilt or shame. And he would give God thanks for the blessing of the food. But there's something higher, there's something greater dictating, Paul, dictating to Paul how he would behave. And it is the advantage of others, the advantage of others. Paul's thinking, what's going to profit? What's going to be expedient for others? What's going to build others up, spiritually speaking? What's going to further the cause of the gospel? What is going to bring people to salvation and encourage spiritual growth and fruitfulness? I mean, Paul fully accepted, didn't he? He fully accepted there was freedom in Christ, freedom from law, freedom from the condemnation of sin and death. But that freedom in his life would only be expressed in ways that built others up and was constructive. He was very determined about that. That was his mindset, his principle of operation. And so he says in verse 24 from the ESV, let no one seek his own good, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbour. It's worth highlighting this statement. There's a magnificent statement as uh, verse 31 through to verse 33, which are very similar. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbour. And if you've got the King James Version here in your margin, you'll have the obvious cross-references to that. Romans 15 and Philippians 2, which we'll touch on in a moment, which, which reference the, the attitudes of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come over to verse 31 then. He goes on to say, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 
And I see this as really as a, an umbrella kind of statement. It covers everything below it. It covers off on all that is below. We quote this verse often, don't we? But how does it actually outwork in our life day to day? And God is not glorified if we meet eaters, say through the thanksgiving that we might offer him for the meat. But he's not glorified if we meet eaters. Nor is he glorified in the abstaining from eating. He makes this point back in chapter 8 and verse 8. But God is glorified, brothers and sisters. He is glorified if we modify and regulate our behaviour so as to profit and to advantage others. So as to further the, the cause of the gospel and bring people to the God of salvation. So as to build others up in, our, in their faith and imitate the spirit and ways of Christ. He's glorified by those things. And our loving Heavenly Father would love to see this mindset influence everything that we do, everything that we put our hand to do, both the small things and the big things, the private things that are unseen and the public things which are seen. Things within the ecclesia, things without the ecclesia. This is the mindset, brothers and sisters, that God would love to see in us. And Paul goes on in verse 32 and verse 33, really reiterating in a way what he said in verse 23 and verse 24. Give none offence, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the ecclesia of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they might be saved. Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, the advantage of many, the ESV says. And from there we've derived our title, the advantage of many, that they may be saved. Ultimately, it's, it's the salvation of others that drives Paul, isn't it? That's what drives him and motivates him and dictates how he will behave and the choices that he's going to make day to day. I love that little expression of many in that verse there. And it just, just makes us reflect on, on some other, other verses, doesn't it? It points to the, the generous and the expansive attitude of the Lord God who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we find, don't we, that little phrase, many, that little word, many, cropping up in, in Old Testament scripture, in Isaiah 53, all about the, the sacrifice of the Lord. My righteous servant shall justify many. Isaiah 53 and verse, verse 11. He will bear the sin of many, we're told in verse 12. In Matthew 26, he said that this is the, the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. Right? This is the expansive attitude that the Lord had. It is shed for many. He's not thinking about himself. He's looking outside of himself and thinking about what is for the advantage of many. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10 speaks of how he was bringing many sons to glory by the Lord Jesus who suffered. Bringing many sons to glory. So you're not preoccupied by the advantage to me or to mine. You know, those close to me, to the my family, to my kids, not preoccupied by that, but thinking outside and beyond ourselves. We have this, this wider view, always bringing others, the many, into our field of view. And then in verse 1 of the following chapter, which obviously connects to chapter 10, he goes on to say, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So he connects this mindset back to the one who is our greatest inspiration, the Lord Jesus he says, imitate Christ as, as I am. Paul was doing the right thing, wasn't he? He had the right attitude, but these things, ideas didn't come from Paul. This is Christ. He's imitating Christ and he appeals to us, you and I today, to do the same. If you want to talk about doing all to the glory of God, if you want to talk about putting aside your own wants and desires and seeking the profit of many that they might be saved, well, this is Christ, isn't it? This is Christ, the one we love and the, long we, the one we long for. And to pick up those passages which the, which the margin, of course, picks up, Romans 15 also reflects this back to Christ. Similar words, very similar context. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Philippians 2, verse 4 and 5. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So both of these passages link this mindset that we're talking about back to our greatest inspiration, the Lord Jesus. So these are his concluding comments 
in chapter 10, and they, they feature some of the key ideas that the Corinthians had to pick up if they were to move forward constructively in their ecclesia, both the weak and the strong together. And I think they remain as key principles for us today. Here they are. These are, these are there's no, no revelation in this, brothers and sisters. We know these things. Do all to the glory of God, he says in verse 31. Give no offence to anyone. Jews or Gentiles or anyone within the ecclesia, give no offence. Let no man seek his own profit or advantage. Seek the advantage of many that they may be saved. Imitate Christ. You know, brothers and sisters, if we, one and all, were to make these principles our modus operandi today, if this was to really reflect the sort of mindset and determination that we have as individuals, what a help this would be for our community in these times of great pressure. Let's go back to chapter 8. Is knowledge the answer? Is, is knowledge one of, the, one of the answers to overcoming this, this, um, this tension, this division which arises around issues of conscience? Well, it's instructive, isn't it, that Paul doesn't push greater knowledge as the solution in chapter 8. Let's just pick it up from uh, chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but charity or love edifies. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Sometimes we might be inclined to think that our unique Bible knowledge and understanding gives us a deeper and a more profound insight, a, a spiritual authority, if you like, that others who see it differently ought to respect and submit to. Sometimes we, we have this kind of attitude, don't we? We know better. We might be tempted to talk other people down because... We think that we know better. We know Christ better. We want to be very cautious about having this type of thinking. Sound interpretation or, or knowledge of the scripture, of course, is something we would all strongly endorse and encourage. But sometimes me trying to construct an, an elaborate scriptural justification for my conscience on a matter, to educate someone else who really should see it my way, sometimes me doing this is simply not the answer, is it? It's simply not the answer. It's not the way of love. I love the way J.B. Phillips puts verse 1. Not a literal translation, of course, but doesn't he pick up the sense? Now, to deal with the matter of meat which has been sacrificed to idols, it is easy to think that we know over problems like this, but we should remember that while knowledge may make a man look big, you can have a great reputation for knowledge, it is only love that can make him grow to his full stature. I think it's a very powerful translation. And so in this section, Paul doesn't come down hard on the weak, doesn't he? Does he? He doesn't suggest to them that they need to grow up spiritually and improve their childlike knowledge of the scripture. But nor does he allow for constant nitpicking and agitating about this and that in the ecclesia that I happen to find offensive to my conscience. If we had time, we'd have a look at Romans 14, verse 1 to establish that. Paul doesn't allow for constant nitpicking where you know, my preferences are being overridden and, and I'm offended and I'll make a song and a dance about all sorts of things in the ecclesia. Paul doesn't want that. But neither does he come down hard on the weak and saying, you need to grow up spiritually and improve your knowledge. He doesn't do that. He says here in this place that knowledge can be a problem, a source of pride. And he warns the proud in very direct language, doesn't he, in chapter 10 and verse 12. Remember this verse? Chapter 10 and verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands, he's talking to the proud, he's talking to the strong. Wherefore, let him that thinks he standeth take heed lest he fall. So knowledge can be a problem and he warns the proud in very direct language in that place, in, in, a, in a section which is all about the, the dangers of idolatry. No, standing my ground because of my self-proclaimed greater knowledge, that's not going to help the course. That's not going to help. What will help is our demonstration of a humble, grateful response to the gospel where we think of others ahead of ourselves. And this is so beautifully illustrated through these chapters and that we'll, we'll spend the rest of our time trying to illustrate that. Come towards the, the end of chapter 8 and we'll pick it up from verse 9. Let's just read verse 9 through to verse 12. But take heed 
lest by any means this liberty or this freedom of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at, a meat, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died? But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their con weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Paul sees the, the actions of the strong here where they partake of the meat. He sees their actions as potentially wounding or damaging the sensitive conscience of the weak brother or sister. Ultimately, potentially, that brother and sister will fall away from their first love of the truth and perish. We might use the expression, you know, they left the truth. Eventually, they left the truth. It doesn't happen overnight, does it? But eventually, they left the truth or they just stopped coming along after a while. How so? Why is this? How can we be responsible for that? Because the weak brother, in coming to Christ, made bold and courageous choices to flee from idolatry. These, these were good choices. They were going to flee from idolatry and all things associated with it, from all its evils. They did not have anything to do with anything that was remotely associated with idolatry. That's a good thing, a good conviction that they brought to Christ when they gave those things away and accepted the gospel's call. But when they're there observing the strong brother and sister exercising their freedom of conscience and eating meats in the idols' temples, they, they could well, it may well cause the weak brother to think twice about his convictions. He starts to doubt himself, to think twice, to question his convictions. Maybe to go back on some of his former choices and start to flirt with the idolatry that he once forsook. This is a slippery road, isn't it? We start going back like that. It's a slippery road and it can easily lead a person to, to, to follow a sinful pathway and perhaps eventually to move away from Christ altogether. How could you do that to a brother, any brother, for whom Christ died, Paul says at the end of verse 11. For whom Christ died. What an emotive statement that is. How could you do this to a brother for whom Christ died? We need to think very carefully about the impact that we have on others as we exercise our freedoms in matters of conscience. I mean, none of us wants to be disrupting or unsettling or breaking down the sincere conscience of another brother or sister that they have towards Christ. The world's going to do that. We'll leave that to the world, brothers and sisters. We want to be doing the exact opposite to that. We want to be in the business of building up and encouraging good conscience toward God. And Paul wants us to be sensitive to the impact that we have on others. Be sensitive about how we express our freedom in Christ. He was, wasn't he? He's very sensitive about it. And note verse 12, actually it's worse than we might think. Not only am I wounding my brother's conscience with potential to destroy his spiritual convictions, I'm actually sinning against Christ, he says in verse 12, who gave his life to save this brother. How could I do that? And Paul's statement in verse 13 is so telling. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Here he is seeking another's good. Here he is seeking the advantage of many that they might be saved. Now, I assume that Paul enjoyed meat. I assume that it's something he enjoyed in his food from day to day, as, as many of us do. He did see it as part of God's gift to be enjoyed by man. We see that in chapter 10 and verse 26. But Paul says that he, he would rule out eating meat ever again if it would cause his brother to fall. That's an astonishing thing. Here's humility. Here's grace and kindness and love in action, isn't it? And could now Ecclesiastes do with more of this kind of thinking from us today, brothers and sisters and young people? It could. It's worth noting here in these verses, isn't it? Firstly, how sensitive he is about how his conduct might affect others for spiritual help or otherwise, for the, for, for the best or for the worst. He's, he's very sensitive about it. He cared. He cared and he cared so deeply. And the second thing to note is what radical self-sacrifice he is prepared to make for the good of others with a more sensitive conscience than his own. Radical things. He wouldn't eat meat, meat while the world stands, he says, for, for the rest of his life. He would sacrifice things that he enjoyed and which he could lawfully partake of because he was interested in the good of others 
who had a more sensitive conscience than his own. Well, we see more of the same in the following chapter, in chapter 9. And here we see him passing up his rights, his rights. Now, we live in a world, don't we, where human rights are almost a religion. We're all educated from the very early age of our life to know our rights and to expect to receive them. My rights, the life that I deserve, the way I deserve to be treated by other people. Well, here in chapter 9, Paul talks about his rights as an esteemed apostle, but highlights how he's not actually pursued them. He hasn't pursued his rights. See, this is not the type of man that he was in Christ. Paul wasn't all about his rights, my rights. For Paul, it was not about the one, about me. It was about the many. What would be to the advantage of many that they might be saved? And so in chapter 9, in having established in the first three verses his special credentials as an apostle and as the spiritual father of their ecclesia, he says in verse 4 to 6, Have we not power to eat and to drink? Chapter 9 and verse 4. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? The AV is clumsy in a, in a way here. Uh, other versions will be clearer. The word power is mentioned three times there in the AV. It it's, uh, refers to his right or his authority. Have we not the right to eat and to drink? Have we not the, the right to forbear working and to be, to be looked after materially by the ecclesia? We also see it twice in verse 12 and verse 18. There's, there's a key word in this, in this uh, section that's worth highlighting that. Three times, verse 4, verse 5 and verse 6. Twice in verse 12, then again in verse 18. So it's all talking about his rights as an esteemed apostle. It was normal, it was something that came with the role of being an apostle that they would receive maintenance from the ecclesia whilst they devoted themselves to preaching the word. You know, there's nothing unusual about this. Like he says in verse 7, if you look in the secular world, you know, what soldier goes out and, and sacrifices his life for his country for free? No, the soldier is paid to be a soldier. Well, what vineyard worker works so hard and doesn't expect to benefit from the, the produce of the vineyard? Verse 7. Or the shepherd who, who, who goes out and looks after the flock and tends to it through all sorts of ups and downs. Surely the shepherd has title, has a right to enjoy the milk from the flock. They do. They benefit from the thing within that they, within, the thing that within they work. This was established, of course, by the law in verse 9, as he says. He, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 25. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. The ox treading the corn ought to be free to feed itself from the corn. That's a principle established in the law. Verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal or your material things? Is that a great ask, he says? If others be partakers of this right over you, are not we rather? Really, a pretty strong case, don't you think? He's got a very strong case. He did have a right to receive material assistance from the ecclesia. But he says in the end of verse 12, Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He hadn't used this right. He chose instead to work for his own income through tent making, that he might support himself and also assist other people. Why would he do this? Because he didn't want in any way to hinder the gospel of Christ. That's an amazing statement. It's worth linking that to the beginning of verse 23. He didn't want to hinder the gospel of Christ. This I do for the gospel's sake, he says in verse 23. The gospel governed Paul's life. It governed his decision-making. It governed his choices. He passed up his rights and chose the more difficult way. Note in verse 12, he says, I suffer all things. This was not an easier path. This was a harder path. He suffered all all things, as he tried to find time to, to make tents and then to market them and, and so forth, adding extra pressure to his life, extra stress to his life, rather than just to sit back to enjoy the benefit and the relief of drawing from the ecclesial fund. He didn't do that. Verse 18 and 19. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my right in the gospel. Paul felt that it was a reward. It was a reward, not measured in dollars and cents. 
but it was a reward to be able to offer the gospel free of charge. For though I be free from all men, verse 19, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Though he was free from all men in the sense that he wasn't being paid by anyone, so he's not under obligation to people who are paying him, though he was free from all men, he says here that his mindset was that by choice he was everyone's servant. He chose to be everyone's servant that I might gain the more. I'm just in awe of his attitude, brothers and sisters and young people. It's just an incredible attitude that he displays there in that section. And these weren't just words. We know that he walked the talk, didn't he? He'd sacrificed things in his life that personally he actually enjoyed. He'd pass up his rights and take the less comfortable, more difficult course for the sake of the gospel to be a servant of all, that they might profit and be saved. Is this you and I, brothers and sisters? Is this you and I? Do we, do we see a reflection of ourselves here in these epic verses? When we come to the Ecclesia and try to nav- navigate all the differences that threaten to derail our togetherness and our unity, is this you and I? Is this my humble response to the grace of God? Whether it's my approach to dress or drinking, or dancing, or worship styles, or looking for change in roles in the ecclesia, or to the format of our meetings, or how we spend our ecclesial funds, or whether the air conditioner should be on or off when it's above 30 degrees. In all of these things, small and large matters, do I bring the mindset to do all to the glory of God, to create no offence, to sacrifice my own wants and likes, my own rights even, for the good of many, to advance the saving gospel. And we see more from Paul, don't we? We see more from Paul. You know, there's a well-known saying, birds of a feather flock together. And sometimes it seems in ecclesial circles this does eventuate more than it should. I speak carefully here. Perhaps... Perhaps it's one advantage of having so many autonomous ecclesias in the one area as we have here in South Australia. I can easily choose to attend one that suits me where things are done just as, it's, as I like them done, just where, how it suits me. And we could argue that's not always a good thing, to surround ourselves with others just like ourselves, avoiding others who are not an easy fit for us. Where's the opportunity for learning from others in that scenario? Where's the appreciation of the diversity of backgrounds and cultures that God has called us from? In verse 20 to 22 of chapter 9, look at Paul's willingness. Look at his his willingness to, to adapt, to be flexible, to accommodate the differing ways of others. Note up front, he, he's not tolerating evil. He's not saying he just gives all these principles away and he'll, he'll just get along with anyone no matter what they're doing. It's not what he's doing here. It's not what he's saying. He's not tolerating evil. He's not compromising the law of Christ. I think that's clear from verse 21. But he finds a way to reach out to others who are different to himself, to build rapport and relationships, to get alongside other people and understand their perspectives. And why does he do this? Well, as he says at the end of verse 22, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. What a statement that is just like verse 19, isn't it? You could highlight those two verses together, verse 19, the end of verse 22. That I might by all means save some. And so he says in verse 20, that unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. And we might think, well, that's not saying much. He was a Jew. He was a Jew. But we know how passionate he was about law versus faith a matter of such sensitivity amongst the Jews. And we know how much Jewish opposition and persecution he faced. Why would he try to get along with the Jews when constantly they dogged his path in his ministries? Yet he obviously tried hard to relate, to be sensitive to their Jewish perspective, to accommodate, to get alongside, to build rapport, to adapt where possible. Verse 21, to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under law to, under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. 
He's driven to associate it with these people as well, to those without law. He's talking, I think he's talking about the Gentiles. Gentiles who have an entirely different background to himself, who had so much that was offensive to the Jew in their lives. And yet Paul seeks common ground. He seeks to be flexible with their differing ways, to get alongside that he might save some of them. And verse 22, tellingly, he speaks about the weak. He says, to the weak became I as weak. He's talking about the weak brothers, brothers and sisters that he's addressed back there in chapter 8. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. Brothers and sisters whose conscience differed to his. They were super sensitive about things like eating meat. But he doesn't avoid them, does he? He doesn't just hang out with the strong. He didn't find an ecclesia where he'd only rub shoulders with those who agreed with his preferences. Nor does he seek to inflame them or to disturb them by pressing their buttons, pressuring them to grow it spiritually. No, to the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. Would you agree that these verses have tremendous relevance to ecclesial life in these latter days? We don't want to be polarising into our little family groups or friendship groups within the ecclesia or as groups of ecclesias. Paul has a very deep desire, doesn't he, to serve and to save all and he'd find ways to create connections and rapport with all kinds of men and women and brothers and sisters who are quite different to him. And he'd do it for the gospel's sake, to the glory of God. I find these verses incredibly instructive. Here's a mindset, here's a, a pattern of behaviour for us to imitate. Not just when we're at the ecclesia. Surely, brothers and sisters, perhaps I talk to those who have children, this begins in our homes, in our neighbourhood, does it not? It's got to start at home. Do our kids see this kind of attitude from mum and dad in their relationship and conduct to each other? A willingness to sacrifice personal wants or preferences? Do our kids see that from mum and dad? A willingness to forgo our rights and serve for the good of many? Do our kids understand the virtue of creating no offence? Here's a memo from my two teenagers, or young adults and teenagers. Do our kids understand the virtue of creating no offence? Being a servant of the whole family, seeking the good of their siblings. Starts at home. Or in our workplaces or neighbourhoods and local community, are we known as people who, do, who don't just assert our own will, always pressing our own will? We're known as people who reach out to those who differ to seek the good of many, not just ourselves. And in the Ecclesia, brothers and sisters, what mindset do we bring? How do we conduct ourselves at business meetings or in committee meetings or in joint activity? How do we show support for the reigning brethren or for those of a different generation to me? or to those outside my natural go-to group in the Ecclesia. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing that Paul is showing us here. In truth, it's the mind of Christ. It's the way of Christ. But as he goes on to say at, the, at the, the end of that chapter, it doesn't come easy, does it? It doesn't come except for a lot of discipline. And, and that's, I think that's interesting. It only really struck me why he goes on to talk the way he does in verse 24 through to verse 27. This is a, an enormous discipline for us to apply to be like this and to have a mindset that this is the way we're going to operate. No matter what the heat, no, no matter how much dust is up in the air, this is the way we're going to operate in the ecclesia. I read from the ESV. I do it all for the, gospel, for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. See, Paul has purpose. I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, we can't overlook just how much Self-discipline is involved to bring under control our, natu our natural selfish inclinations. If we're going to rise to this positive and constructive mindset that Paul has shown to us, we have to apply this discipline, don't we? We have to have this discipline to try and have this self-control over our natural instincts. It isn't an easy road. It doesn't just happen. 
We note his sense of of purpose, of deliberate direction there in verse 26. He's seeking the advantage of many that they might be saved. And he's being willing to sacrifice his preferences and his rights. And that's not the easy or the comfortable path. He takes a deliberate approach of self-control and moderation under the hand of God to put away the natural way, which so often offends and breaks down. So it's a deliberate approach, isn't it? That's really what I take out of verse 24 through to verse 27. This is a deliberate approach. He has purpose. It's something that's thought about often and prayed about as we strive to become more like us, our Lord and Saviour day by day. We don't have time to comment further on that. So just to wrap up, brothers and sisters, I think we'd, we'd accept, we'd agree that there is a lot of pressure on our ecclesias and our sense of community today and the year 2022. I'm sure we all love our ecclesia. It's such a precious and a vital thing to us and, and we want to see it thrive and prosper in fruitfulness toward God and our Lord Jesus. But there's an urgent need, isn't it? There is an urgent need for us to devote ourselves with renewed energy to build and to, to pull together, to work through our differences, to reach out across divides, to reach out across the generations. And Paul's shown us the way in these chapters. He's shown us the required mindset. We have the tools. They're not difficult to understand. Do all to the glory of God. Give no offence, he said. Let no man seek his own profit. Rather seek the advantage of many that they may be saved. Focus on imitating Christ. And so until our Lord comes, brothers and sisters, may God find each of us active in this cause, displaying that fitting humility humility which we require and displaying a a very sensitive and thoughtful love for our brothers and sisters here and wherever they be found. A quote from a book by Brother Burns, he writes, we're only required to keep three rituals, baptism once in our lives, the breaking of bread and drinking of wine, usually once a week but more or less if desired, and he refers to a couple of passages there, and the wearing and non-wearing of a head covering by females and males respectively at the memorial meeting. So writes our brother Colin. The truth of this statement in its broad sense has been generally accepted in our community through at least 150 years. The practice of covering or uncovering by sisters and brothers has long been honoured in our community. At formal ecclesial gatherings like memorial meetings, uh, Bible classes, studies and such like, and even in informal gatherings like discussion groups or home classes, weddings, these sorts of things. The ritual of Covering or uncovering the head has even been extended to the unbaptised. Girls wearing hats or coverings at meetings, boys taking their caps off in meetings for prayer and so on. It would be my subjective observation, and yours may or may not uh, be the same, might differ, uh, but my observation probably would be that our understanding and our appreciation of the principle of the head covering and the head uncovering in the ecclesia has waned somewhat. I wonder if we're too often just going through the motions of doing something that we've always done without having potentially a deep conviction as to why we do it, what it's all about. It's quite possible that in time it has become for us more of a way of dressing than a deliberate, spiritually driven practice. Further, of course, in, the, in our ecclesial, uh, ecclesial world, in the Brotherhood, there in some quarters is also a move away from the practice of this ritual in the ecclesia today, particularly on the basis that Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11, which were just read for us, are culturally relevant to those brothers and sisters of the Greco-Roman world to whom Paul wrote, and not relevant or binding on 21st century believers in the Western world, where the cultural norms of the day, our day, are so removed from that which Paul experienced. I'm planning in today's classes, the two classes that we've got, it's really just one 
class divided into two. Um, planning to examine closely and methodically the principles and the practice spoke, <coughs> excuse me, spoken of in 1 Corinthians 11 and to provide some clear answers and explanations where possible to the many questions that are often raised in and around this matter. I really believe it's important for us as individual brothers and sisters and as an ecclesia to come together with purpose and to know why we do what we do and to honour the ritual of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, not out of habit, but because of our commitment to and our conviction about the positive, spiritually uplifting principles that are involved. If we had time, I'd love to take comments and questions. There's many people here who will have thought about these things a lot longer and a lot deeper than I have. It could be risky to take questions because the likes of Uncle Gordon will probably ask a curly question or two. But uh, I don't think we really have a lot of time for questions and comments particularly. We'll see how we go. Maybe at the end of session two, if there is time, we'll open it up for five to ten minutes for, uh, for questions and comments, which will be very welcome. But uh, I might be being a little bit optimistic that there'll be that time left. You know, it's, when we talk about this, and there's, there's a lot of discussion about this, I have to say I've, I've rarely heard a talk uh, in formal ecclesial gathering on this, if ever. I hear plenty of talk around the barbecue and, and these sort of these informal environments about it. It is discussed amongst us. Uh, it's very easy uh, in these discussions that we have to, to focus on the negative and completely miss the beauty and the power of what God has ordained. For example, we might focus on the, the issue, the perceived issue of male domination, of women being suppressed or made to feel lesser. We might be swayed by the argument that we're out of step with the contemporary values of society. Other churches have given this away. I mean, other churches gave this ritual away long ago. And here we are, treating our young women in the ecclesia as if they're different. Our young women will be lost because the ecclesia is intent on treating them differently to men, suppressing their role in the ecclesia. Well, sometimes we just get distracted, don't we, by sort of the, the nitpicky things the distracting things about, well, what type of head covering is actually sufficient? You know, does it have to be a veil? Should it be a scarf? What about a wide brim hat with a garland of flowers? Or a headband? You know, what is it? We, we can debate these things amongst ourselves as to what exactly is required. These things are kind of nitpicky in a way and often get well away from the, the, the core and the positive principles that we could be talking about. I want to encourage a completely different perspective when we, when we look at this today. Firstly, I'd encourage just a, a simple humility, just a, a simple, basic humility to the, to the traditions received by the apostles from the Lord. Secondly, an appreciation that the rich symbology, spiritual symbology of the head covering and uncovering practice enriches us. It enriches us as a community. It doesn't diminish us. It builds us up in our most holy faith. It is a small but a very significant reminder each meeting of the headship of Christ, the glory of God and the submission of the ecclesia to our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. These matters are matters of high principle, aren't they? And I think it's important for the ecclesia as a whole, both men and women, both brothers and sisters, to come to grips with this. Now just before we move on, uh, there's, there's lots of helpful resources out there, but I've I just mentioned up front I found these useful to consider. Uh, Brother Burns' book, God, Christ, Man and Woman, is an excellent read. Um, Leo Morris um, in the uh, Tyndale New Testament commentary series, 1 Corinthians. Brother Michael Ashton's book, The Challenge of Corinthians. Brother Michael Edgecombe's In the Image of God, it's very, very useful. Uh, John Lorgenbury's a quite an extensive uh, series of online presentations, very thought-provoking, Christ and Gender Roles. Brother Barling, an older book, The Letter to Corinth, and also a very useful paper, which I picked up from Brother David McClure in Sydney, Paul's Advice on Head Coverings. All very useful resources, and there's many other things we could tap into beside, I'm sure. So we asked the question up front, what, what's the scriptural basis for head coverings within the ecclesia? And, and the obvious answer is verse 2 to verse 16, as was just read from the first Corinthians in chapter 11. And so we read in verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances 
as I deliver them to you. The AV margin says the traditions. You keep the traditions, you keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. You know, the very mention of the word, this word tradition, is often enough, is often just enough in itself to make us wary, isn't it? We're a bit cautious about this word, especially with our local community where many, many of us have grown up with a very strong culture of traditions that were passed down to us by previous generations of believers. We're, we're fairly sensitive about this, these ideas of traditions. And I would say, if, you would look, if we looked at it objectively, uh, the traditions we received, by and large, most of and much of which we received by way of tradition, were good traditions. And I'm not downplaying that whatsoever. But we want to make a differentiation here. Paul's use of this word tradition here uh, in this verse does not sit equally with the traditions that we might commonly think of today. They're different things. I also want to be very clear that this is not the Jewish traditions which Jesus often, often criticised. For example, in Mark chapter 7, verse 9, he said, Full well, you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. You know, they, they prefer to hold on to their tradition, which they had developed through, through history. Hold on to those things, rather than hold on to the clarity and, and, the, and the direct message of the commandment of God. They'd gone astray. When Paul uses this term here in verse 2, ordinances or traditions, he's not talking about the, the Jewish traditions. He's not trying to uphold the Jewish traditions. What he's speaking about here is apostolic tra tradition. The apostolic tradition which was passed on to the ecclesias in the first century. We see that he says, they were delivered to you. So Paul had them and he delivered them to the Corinthian ecclesia as he did in many other places. And I think it's useful just to establish that. Just turn over to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. I might just, might just take a read. Is there someone I want to read for us? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15, perhaps with a, a loud voice. Um, just to establish this, this idea that uh, he talks in other places about uh, this, these traditions. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, and then someone might pick up chapter 3 and verse 6. We've got a reader there. Thanks, Greg. And 3 verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received from us. All right, thank you. So you can see similar language is used in, in those other places. This time it's in reference to the Thessalonian ecclesia, all right, a, a different ecclesia. Uh, and the first of those mentions that you receive these things either by word or, what did he say? By word or epistle. So, you know, he either has verbally passed those things on or he's written them down. And those apostolic traditions have been passed on. This happened commonly in other places. So we're talking about apostolic traditions or ordinances there in 11 verse 2. And we want to be very clear about that. We have barely any higher authority in teaching or tradition than the apostles, do we? They were chosen and appointed by the Lord to develop his ecclesia. We know in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it speaks of us continuing, doesn't it? Continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Ephesians 2 talks about the fact as a spiritual house we're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. All right, so this is some authority which is speaking to us here. But, you know, we notice this term delivered from verse 2, is also used again in verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. But here Paul adds something, doesn't he? He establishes that what he delivered to the Corinthians, the, the ordinances he passed on to the Corinthians, was not his own ideas, but something that the Lord actually taught him. Turn over to chapter 15, verse 3. Chapter 15 and verse 3. Very similar. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So the apostles passed these things on, but they didn't conjure them up themselves. They received these things from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that, for example, in the days after the resurrection, Jesus spent quite a lot of time with his disciples talking about all sorts of things. And I imagine some of these kinds of things would have been part of his discussion when they started to move from 
the, 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 the period of his ministry to the time when ecclesias were to be established and formed and, and would have to have some modus operandi. Jesus may well have discussed those sort of things with the apostles or the disciples as they were in that period of time. Why is this important? You might think this is a little technicality. Why is it important? Well, I think it establishes the authority behind this teaching in 1 Corinthians 11. It is a teaching delivered by an apostle, nonetheless, and actually something received in the first place from the Lord Jesus. And we'd accept that as high authority, wouldn't we? We would accept that as high authority indeed. Not something that we'd lightly ignore or brush off as unimportant. It's just a local custom of the day in the, in the then Greco-Roman world. So it's a reasonable question. Why don't we read Paul and others reiterating this teaching elsewhere? Now, why, why do we not find really any reference to this outside of the verses that have been read for us today? Well, I think the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, how many times does an apostle have to spell something out to Christian believers before we think it's important? Wouldn't one significant passage from an apostle suffice? Do we need more than one? Secondly, let's just think about what he says when he comes to his conclusion in verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, he says in verse 16, we have no such custom, neither the ecclesias of God. The word contentious there means those who are fond of strife, those who love disputes. And we know that uh, Corinth wasn't short of a few of those kind of people. They, lo they loved a bit of a, dis a dispute about all sorts of things. And here they are advocating a novel new practice in the ecclesia. They're, they're challenging the tradition. And the customs, we have no such custom that the, 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 the verse says there. The custom refers to a long-standing practice. It's only used once elsewhere in the scripture, and that's in John chapter 18, verse 39, where it speaks of the custom that the, the Romans had of, of releasing a prisoner all right, uh, at the time. And we know this, this happened with Barabbas. That was a custom, a long-standing custom of the Romans with the Jewish people. Paul says, we have no, no custom. And I think he's referring to himself and all the apostles. You know, as far as we apostles are concerned, we have no such custom. We have no, we have no such practice uh, such as you're suggesting, neither the ecclesias of God. And if we had time, you could turn up some of those other references earlier on uh, to, to, to see how he keeps going back to this idea that other ecclesias uh, receive the same sorts of teachings, the same sorts of traditions. Uh, they're in step. They do the same things because they've received these things from the apostles who have established the, the ecclesias in the ecclesial world. So the common practice taught by the apostles was not being challenged in other ecclesias. I think that's the point. Other ecclesias were not challenging this process. It seems to be, have been a Corinthian thing, along with their challenges to lots of other apostolic traditions like questions on the resurrection and so forth. It's really the Corinthians who are out of step with other ecclesias. And so it's in the letter to the Corinthians that we find that this matter is spelled out. But thirdly, I think we take a, a note from verse 16 that really, as far as the apostle is concerned, he, he would have us that we, we wouldn't be having contention and strife around this practice, both in his time and in ours. He wouldn't encourage that. And I think that's important for us to see. Moffat's translation of verse 16 is interesting. He uses uh, the I rather than we in the uh, second half there. Most, most versions would say we acknowledge. But Moffat says, if anyone presumes to raise objections on the point, well, I or we, if you like, acknowledge no other mode of worship and neither do the churches of God. All right? So we're establishing authority here in verse 2 and verse 16. Let's just think about the context uh, of these verses here. The context is important. Fortunately, we've actually covered off on quite a bit of this last night. In chapter 8 to 10, we saw that he talks about matters of individual conscience, where we're exercising our freedom in Christ. He speaks about the weak and the strong. He speaks about meat offered to idols and not creating offence. And some of the key take-homes from that section of scripture are these, taking choices that benefit and help prosper the gospel, seeking another's benefit, not your own, doing all to the glory of God. But when we look forward from chapter 8 to 10, which we looked at last night, through to chapter 11 to 14, 
he turns to some matters of ecclesial functioning and behaviours. All right? the, the whole section, 11 through to 14, is talking about matters of ecclesial functioning and behaviours. He talks about the issue about head coverings in verse 2 to 16 of chapter 11, about the breaking of bread meeting in verse 17 to the end of chapter 11. In chapter 12, he speaks about the, the, using the various spiritual gifts in the functioning of the ecclesia. And in chapter 14, the misuse of the gift of tongues. And he concludes with that really important principle, and I think it's worth noting this one. Uh, we know it well, but it, it, sort, of, it sort of bookends this, 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 this uh, section of Corinthians. 14 verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. All right? And I think really that applies to all that has gone before, from chapter 11 right through to uh, chapter 14 and verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Now, I think the context of chapter 11 seems to be in ecclesia, in ecclesia as opposed to in-house. I think the two situations are differentiated in the Corinthian record. On the one hand, ecclesial gatherings that centre on the breaking of bread are stolen in ecclesia. And on the other hand, what happens outside these particular gatherings are stolen in-house. And we've got some... Uh, some scripture there to, to try and verify that, uh, which we're not going to go through in detail. You notice that expression um, in the ecclesia or in ecclesia as it literally is um, in chapter 14, verse 19, 28, 34, 35. It's talking about the time when everyone came together and is coming together, uh, which is the expression that chapter 11 uses so much in verse 17, 18, 20, 33 and 34, where you come together not in your private homes in small gatherings, but you come together into one place, as chapter 11, verse 20 speaks about, as does chapter 14, verse 23. So there's two situations going on here with the brothers and sisters. At times, they are in ecclesia, all right? That means they're all coming together into one place. It'd be quite a sizable gathering we'd expect. But on the other hand, there's, there's obviously times when they're at, they're at home, in-house, and he refers to this in uh, chapter 11, Verse 34, if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together under condemnation. You know, there's things that you do at home. There's, there's other times when you're together uh, and there's, there's perhaps other ways you can behave in the privacy of your own home or in small gatherings. So it seems in my mind, I think it's reasonable to, to, to see it this way, that there's this scenario of things being in, in ecclesia and other uh, different occasions where things are done in-house. It is noted that the, the language of verse 2 and verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 11 is quite similar. You see that? He says, I praise you, brethren, in verse 2, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. But when he comes to verse 17, he says, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. And I think he's sort of going back to sort of where, where he started, but now he's got something else to address within the ecclesia. So he's dressed head coverings or uncovering in the first bit. Then he gets back to another in ecclesia issue, which is the, the, the I guess, the, the spirit and the, the conduct of the memorial meeting. Both of these things uh, are relevant to the coming together in ecclesia situation. And because of this reason, a lot of brothers and sisters believe that the head covering and the uncovering ritual is most relevant to formal ecclesial meetings, particularly the memorial meeting. In verse 4 and 5, both, uh, we find that both are linked to the ritual to, of, to praying and prophesying. And likely these are public activities, all right? Praying and prophecy, prophesying. They're not in-house private activities. We say that because the very nature of prophesying, as seen in chapter 14, is a publicly revealed message from God, a publicly revealed message from God, sometimes in an unknown language. And we know chapter 14 explains that the, the, the message had to be intelligible to all the audience of those brothers and sisters who were there gathered, and also for any unbelievers who have to be present as well. And so the very nature of prophecy is a, a, a public thing in public meeting. And so I think uh, verse 4 and 5 again would verify that the fact that, that this, this, the context of this is in ecclesia, when the ecclesia comes together for formal gatherings. Now, whether an individual brother or sister chooses to extend the practice of this ritual to private, informal spiritual activity, and some do, is probably a personal choice for one to exercise one's personal conscience. It's a conscience issue. 
And of course, such a conscience should be respected by other brothers and sisters who may not have a conscience so to do. So we come to verse 3, which is really a key verse. And if we don't get our heads around verse 3, then we're not going to get our heads around the whole section because this is a foundational statement. The ritual about head coverings is, is about highlighting and projecting the truths of verse 3 to the glory of God. And it goes like this, doesn't it? There's a divine hierarchy, if you like, a divinely ordained spiritual order, if you like. We have God, then we have Christ, then we have man, and then we have woman. But we notice first that Paul doesn't actually quite list it like that. He begins with the headship of Christ. It's interesting, isn't it? But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. That's where he starts. And this is one of the crucial messages of the whole epistle, isn't it? Christ is the one who is preeminent. He's the chief. He's the one above, the head. Remember how chapter 1 of Corinthians in the first 10 verses starts with this, this strong message about elevating Christ, about promoting the glory of Christ, not man. Because the Corinthians had lost sight of this, hadn't they? They'd taken their eyes off Christ and they focused on men and they, they were lining up behind impressive, um, impressive leaders, their earthly leaders like Paul or Apollos and Peter. He speaks of this in chapter 1, doesn't he? So the Corinthians had lost their focus on Christ. And Paul in this section is really bringing it very much back into centre. And he, so he starts with this. He starts with this, the fact that the head of every man is Christ. He tries to bring them back to the reality that everything centres around Christ, who revealed the glory of God, and no flesh should glory in God's presence. So the way that Paul starts there in that verse is highly significant. Now, there's no dispute, is there? There's no dispute on the floor of the ecclesia here today that... Christ is the head of the man or brothers and that God is the head of Christ. There's no dispute about that. What is disputed, particularly in our era of humanity, in our age, is that man is the head of the woman. Because this is out of step with social norms in society today. And of course we have some, we have some sympathy, don't we, as to why? Because too often in history, man has made a very poor task of being the head of the woman in the family or in society, even as Adam was in the Garden of Eden. A poor example, he was. And it's been such monumental failure ever since on the behalf of man um, in, in this respect. He's not shown himself to be a worthy head of the woman too often in history. Just a question. There's been lots of questions that are raised in and around this, and I want to cover off on some of them. Should the middle expression of verse 3 be read the head of a wife is a husband. Right? Some hold this view. And unfortunately, some of, the, some of the versions of the ESV want to have a bit of it both ways, which I don't think is fair. I think we, should, we probably should read through consistently uh, if man, uh, if it's man and woman in that broader sense or if it's husband and wife in the narrower sense. I think it should be consistent through the verses, through this section. Should the middle expression be read, the head of a, of a wife is her husband? Now, people are a little bit more comfortable with that. Well, it is a similar statement to Ephesians 5.23, isn't it? Um, which I think might be on the screen. No? Um, for the husband is the head of the wife. That's the way Paul writes it in Ephesians 5, verse 23. So it might be appropriate to... Um, that statement is appropriate in its context of marriage, but I don't think it's the appropriate way to read uh, the verse here in chapter 11 and verse 3 of Corinthians. The word man in verse 3 is the Greek word aina. It's found 14 times in verse 13 through to verse 14. Verse, uh, sorry, the, the woman on the other hand is the Greek word gune. It's found 16 times from verse 3 to verse 15. The word anna well, I think that's how you pronounce it, and it probably isn't. Um, this can be translated man or husband. It can be translated both ways, and the context will decide for us which way we're going to interpret the, the meaning. The same can be said of the other word, guni, all right, for woman. It can be translated woman or wife. Which is correct is determined by the context. So what, we can, what can we determine from the context here? It's an interesting exercise, isn't it, just to actually substitute that word 
Um, I'd be interested to see what you think about uh, the way it works. I don't think, it's, I don't think it works too well, uh, would be my conclusion. For example, in verse 3, um, we read that the head of every man is Christ. And we would see it if it's in the narrow sense of husband and wife, not man and woman. Um, the head of every husband is Christ. Well, that might be true, but you know, it's, it's only a small part of, of truth, isn't it? What about all the others? Or the, the, the non-husbands? Is Jesus the head of them? Uh, verse 4. Every husband praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonours his head. Well, that might be true, but is it not true of unmarried brothers as well? Verse 7. For a man indeed, or a husband indeed, ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Um, is that not also true of unmarried men? Begs the question, doesn't it? Well, I think verse 12 is as clear as we get. For it says, therefore, as the wife is of the husband, even so is the husband also by the wife. Well, that's just simply not true. That's just simply not true. Wives do not give birth to their husbands. So I think uh, it's, fairly, it's fairly plain by, just, by, by going through the exercise of substituting those words into the context here, uh, that to see it in the narrow sense of husbands and wives and to interpret the middle expression of verse 3 in that way is not fair to the context. And so I think it, it'd be fair to draw a line through that idea, despite the fact that the ESV, ESV if you use that, is going to confuse us. All right. I think it seems quite apparent that 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 um, is, is meant to be read as, for example, the AV has it. That's correct. The head of the woman is the man. And you'll find the New King James Version, the NIV, the Revised Version and others are translated this way. That's the way God ordained it right from the beginning. And it's noteworthy that Paul goes back to creation. He goes all the way back to creation in verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10 and verse 12 to establish the reasons and the principles that lie behind his instructions. The next question is, is the word head in verse 3 to be understood in the sense of the leader, the authority, someone who is preeminent, one above? Well, this is the natural understanding of the term, I would think. We think of the way the word head is used in our language today. We speak of the head of secondary school or the, the head of state. The headline, all right, that bit at the top in bold, which, which tells you what the rest of the article is about, the headline, the head prefect, the headmaster, the headquarters. All right, we, we understand in our, our, our vernacular today the way this, this word head is used. In the New Testament, we find the Greek word behind head, this word kephali, um, used some 76 times, and so often, probably most often, it's used in a literal way. Uh, it re refers to the head either literally or figuratively. Most occasions it is of the literal head. For example, in Matthew 8, 20, where it speaks of the, the Lord, the Son of Man, has not where to lay his head. He didn't literally have a place to, to lay his literal head. All right? But there's a lot of times, there's a number of times where it's used figur figuratively in the New Testament. And this allows us, if we survey these passages, these, these other passages, it allows us, I think, to pick up the sense of the word and perhaps to understand... Um, what, what it means here in verse 3, where it's often disputed. I have these listed out here, uh, and I want us, again, to spend a, a few minutes, I might spend four or five minutes doing this, I think it's a worthwhile exercise, and by all means, talk to people around you or behind you. Um, just, just choose one or two or a few, and just work your way through and see what you think the, the sense of this word head is in these contexts, which you're going to look at, because I think that's a very fair way a very fair way to, to arrive at a conclusion of how we should understand the idea of the woman, sorry, the man being the head of the woman here in this verse in Corinthians. This is, this is crucial to this whole section. Could I just say, firstly, you might look past Acts 4 and 1 Peter um, 2 because they're, they're well known and it's the, um, both of them talking about the same thing that the Lord Jesus has, has become the head of the corner of the, of the spiritual house. All right? Yeah, the, the chief cornerstone, if you like. Uh, that's, a, that's a very obvious one. Right? He's, he's the chief and the most important stone in that building. Um, you might want to look at the ones in Ephesians or Colossians. Or Acts and Peter, if you choose. 
All right. If I was um, if I was just to pick up a couple, um, I might start say with um, Ephesians one twenty two. You might have had a look at that, um, and I think the context is important there. Ephesians chapter one verse twenty two. Let's let's pick it up in verse twenty. Um, Ephesians one, which he wrought in Christ. This is God did, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him up from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above, see the language here, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in the world, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the ecclesia. All right? Uh, what sense would you take the, the word head to to have in that context? Surely it's speaking of someone who is above, someone who is preeminent, someone who is over the rest above. Uh, if we were to turn a couple of pages over, it's perhaps to Colossians, uh, that Colossians 1 is good. Colossians 1 verse 18, and again, pick up the context. Colossians 1 verse 16, for example. Um, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. This is talking about our Lord Jesus. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head. There's our word. He is the head over the body, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. All right? He will be above all. He'd have preeminence above all people and all things. Uh, it's quite consistent, I think, through those passages. What would our conclusion be? What would your conclusion be? I think, based upon the, the figurative use of this word kafali elsewhere in the epistles, it's been cl- concluded by most, I think, that 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 is a very clear statement about the divine hi- hierarchy, a spiritual order that God ordained and created. God has ordained that man is the head, the leader, having authority over the woman. But wait. Man himself is under authority. That's the point, isn't it? Man himself is under authority. Christ is over the man. The leader, preeminent, having authority over the man. But then again, Christ himself is under authority. Ultimately, God himself is preeminent. The authority over all, the leader of all creation. Ultimately, this serves to the glory of God and his son. And surely all brothers and sisters would rejoice with that conclusion. And note this, this spiritually ordained hierarchy has its origins in the very beginning, before the fall, not after the fall. It has its origins in the beginning, before the fall, where man was created in the image and likeness of the Elohim and woman was created out of man and for man, as spelled out by Paul in verse 7 to 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I think it's important for us to also notice that verse 3 here, if I turn back there, Verse 3 in Corinthians is not at all a licence or a justification for men or brothers to exercise lordship and dominion and power and control over women. It's not that. It's not the spirit of it at all and never was God's intention. If you want to feel, if you want to try and sort of get a grip and a feel for what it is, is about, what this headship is about, what virtue lies in respecting what God has ordained, we need, need look no further than the extraordinary relationship that exists between God and his only beloved son, or between Christ and the ecclesia, his bride, or between the, the believing husband and wife, as expounded in Ephesians chapter 5, a rich, codependent relationship where the needs of the other are prioritised over my needs because of love, where there is a willing to, willingness to serve either way, to sacrifice, you know, it's a beautiful thing which the scripture paints to us. It's not something for us to shy away from or to be embarrassed about, no matter what the prevailing views of society might be. And if you might be wondering whether it's the best model, I have to ask you, brothers and sisters and young people, have you seen anywhere in society today where they're offering us a better model than what God has offered to us? Have you seen us an improved social model out there in the world? Really, they're just tending to, to chaos to complete chaos. We have no reason. We have no good reason to move away from what God has ordained because it is a beautiful thing and we have incredible models. The the relationship between God and Christ, the relationship between Christ and the ecclesia 
uh, as inspirational models for us to, to shape our lives around. And so I'd say this, I think it's really our wisdom. It's our wisdom to respect what God has set in place in verse 3, that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. And the ritual of head covering and uncovering in, in this, this section is all related to this verse. We find he keeps referring back to the head, doesn't he? Verse 4, verse 5, verse 7, and verse 10. He keeps talking about the head or things to do with the head. It's about the headship of Christ. It's about the glory of God and promoting these things as part of the spiritual tone in Ecclesia. There has been a novel idea which has arisen perhaps in the last 60 years or so that uh, the word kafali doesn't mean uh, what we suggested. Um, it actually means the source or the origin instead of the idea of something, one who is the leader or authority. It's a completely different uh, meaning to the word. See, the idea that man being the leader, the idea of man being the leader in the home uh, in our society today is just an old-fashioned idea, isn't it? It's sort of out of vogue. In fact, the very idea today is dressed up to represent all that has gone wrong with male leadership and power, control, abuse, domestic violence and so forth. They're all sort of laying at the door of this idea that man thinks he's hit the head of the woman, as if God got it wrong. Unfortunately, if we take this idea of the word kafali in this context and others, meaning the source or origin, I think it completely unravels the sense and the power of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2 to 16. It just does nothing for it. And really, it only leads us down the pathway where these verses no longer carry any significance or relevance to believers today. So I think we need to be wary about that approach. It's, it's common enough. It may be popular in today's world, but the question is, is it right? Now, I found this was a useful thing to do. It's not, uh, this wasn't my idea. I read this in, the, in Brother Burns' book. It's, it's an excellent idea. Uh, it, it's, it's useful for us to, to separate the, the instructions um, in 1 Corinthians 11 from the embedded reasons for the instructions. Right? So we've got instructions on one hand, and then on the other hand he says, well, this is why. I'll give you the reasons why. Let's separate and take out the instructions just, just on their own and see what they are. For example, in uh, verse 5 at the beginning, we have an instruction. Uh, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. And then he gives a reason for that at the end of verse 5, for that is even all one as if she was shaven. Or well, the beginning of verse 7, we have an instruction, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, and then we have a reason given for it, don't we, in verse 7, verse 8, and verse 9, reasons based on Genesis. So, in some ways, this simplifies it. It, it, it simplifies it for us just to boil it down to the basic instructions. And it would read something like this. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having, having his head covered, dishonours his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonours her head. A man ought not to cover his head. The woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. It is improper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered. Follow the example of the apostles and all the other ecclesias, and do not be contentious. So, when we read through that, you might conclude that the, the actual instructions, when we, when we pull them out in the context and just list out the actual instructions, they're pretty straightforward. And think, if an apostle gave these instructions without any of the added explanations, we'd still be obliged to respect and follow them, would we not? But of course, Paul does provide his rationale. He, he does provide the reasons, doesn't he? He provides explanations which we're going to examine and we desire to understand and to appreciate. But the practice of head covering or uncovering doesn't rest on whether we fully understand or agree with Paul's reasons. How are we going? I know it's a uh, Saturday afternoon, it's not the uh, easiest time to be uh, sitting through a session. We might try and use another five, ten minutes and then we'll call it quits for our first session. Another question, perhaps there's three, three questions we'll deal with and then we'll, uh, we'll have a break. Um, is, the, is the head covering being referred to the woman's hair? Now that's, this is 
sometimes um, a view that's held and it's really based on what verse 15 says. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. And people pick up on that straight away. Uh, it's given to her for a covering. Well, does that mean that you know, throughout this context, the covering being talked about is the woman's hair as opposed to something else that you might put on the top of her hair? All right. And I think the answer is no. See, whatever the woman is able to put on, the man is able to take off. All right. It's clearly not a, ref a reference to hair. Verse 6 at the beginning would make no sense uh, if it's the hair that uh, we have in mind. It would read something like this. If the woman has no hair, let her also be shorn. You know, that would be a nonsense. It wouldn't make sense. If the woman has no hair, let her be shorn. All right? So it's not, um, it's not fair to the context to, to understand it this way. And it's important to, to notice that in verse 15 there, that word covering... In the author, as it's translated in the authorised version, is a different word to those used in verse 5, verse 6 and verse 7. It's only used once in this context. Peribolian, something like that. Um, the Greek word means something thrown around. A mantle, a veil, a covering, a, a vesture. And it seems to refer to something like an item of adornment that the woman is given to dress with. An item of adornment that the woman is given to dress with. That's the sort of sense that lies behind this word. It says, uh, it speaks about her, her hair being a glory to her, hair, to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now, do we think the woman's hair is a glory to her? Do we think it's a dress item for her? Well, if you wanted an illustration of this, just think of the, the wedding day that commonly happens, uh, amongst our circles at least, the preparation of the hair, you know? The, the enormous effort that goes into preparing hair for the big day. It starts at 6am, probably before they even think about food and all the rest. You're up with, before the birds, doing something about the hair. See, the hair is a big deal. Uh, it is an ornament to the girls, to the women, and it's very much part of their, their, their external adornment and presentation uh, on those special occasions. So it's a different word. It's a different word that's used there in verse 15 and it makes no sense in the context to, to uh, see earlier on references to the covering referring to the woman's hair. It's talking about something that she puts on top of her hair and, and, and her head. Hopefully in answering some of these questions we're creating more, uh, more clarity than confusion. Um, does every inch of hair have to be covered? You know, I think that's a weird kind of question to ask, but um, it seems to me that there's, there's you know, we see it around, that people have this, um, this conscience to completely cover um, everything on their head, you know, a, a very um, profound covering. You know, I mean, in some cultures not related to our own, you know, they, they go to vast extremes of, of covering their, their head. Is that required? Is, is this what the Apostle's driving at here? I suggest the answer is no. Um, the word cover... In verse 6, which is used twice, and the word is used again in verse 7, that Greek word means to cover wholly, that is veil, cover or hide. Now I'd suggest that the word points to hiding and covering the head with more material rather than less. So that a thin headband, for example, um, is quite different to something like a scarf in that respect. A thin headband is not really a head covering, is it? It's not really hiding much of the head or the hair, uh, whereas something like a scarf does more of that. It covers more. Uh, we see uh, the girls and the women of a certain Christian denomination down in the shops and out in public wearing um, these headbands nowadays, quite narrow headbands. And to me, it's like a hint of a head covering that I feel they can get away with in public. I, mean, I sort of understand where they're coming in a way, but in a way it's just a hint of something and not necessarily uh, what Paul was driving at. Can I make the point? It's not a modesty issue here. All right? They were in the, you know, the immoral city of Corinth. But this, this head covering business is not driven by the fact that Paul wants them to be modest to cover up all their beautiful hair so that no, one, no other man in any way could be seduced uh, by those women. He's not talking about that sort of thing. He's not talking about avoiding uh, placing temptation before men. That's got nothing to do with this context. He does talk about modesty in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. Let's remember when it comes to the form of the head covering that it's a symbol. It is a symbol. 
and the exact shape and form of the covering, be it burqa style or scarf or beret or doily or the beanie, you know, that the, the form is not prescribed to us. And I don't think it's wise for ecclesiastes to impose rules around the form of head covering or the, the form of head covering that must be worn. We, we, we want to avoid that kind of rulemaking. But one thing we can say, it certainly wasn't supposed to be a fashion, a fashion item, was it? You know, this sort of a, a statement to the ecclesia when you, when you walk in and, and you can't help but notice the, the awesome hat that uh, the, the, the sister or the girl has, has walked in with. We all know, I think, the language of 1 Peter chapter 3. We don't need to turn there particularly. Um, but, Paul, but Peter, in that context, counsels us against getting too carried away with external adornment, doesn't he? Let's focus on, on dressing up the, 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 the inner spirit of Christ within us rather than the, the external um, fashion that we could, we could show and display in public. 1 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4. So the head covering was not supposed to be a, a, a dress item, a look-at-me type of statement because that would go against the, the spirit of the symbol, wouldn't it? It would go against the very spirit of the symbol, which is all about the promotion of and the glory of Christ and of God, his head. Got time for uh, one more question here. What do we think exactly was going on in the ecclesia uh, in Corinth? All right. What exactly was going on? We're not told explicitly what was going on. We'll come back to the question of praying and prophesying uh, later on in session number two. But what it seems, as we have read through there today, it seems that certain sisters, uh, perhaps those who were of a contentious nature from verse 16, I don't think it'd be all the sisters, it'd be some who, who, who wanted to have a contention about this and, to, and debate the issue. It seems that certain sisters within the ecclesia um, who were engaged with praying in the ecclesia and were also legitimately exercising the spirit gift of prophesying in the ecclesia were, sh were assuming an equal role to the brothers in the ecclesia in contravention of the order, the, or the ordained order of verse 3. I think that's basically what was happening. And so the, the, the head covering which the sister would usually wear in respect of the divine order was being set aside a sign of her increased independence from man. And Paul found it improper. Paul found it inappropriate, even shameful, to pick up his language in verse 6. He finds it shameful. And he sees that it was symptomatic of a general disorder in the ecclesia, which he tried to address uh, through these chapters, chapter 11 to 14, where he concludes at the end that all things should be done decently and in order. So I think that's, that's basically... Uh, what was going on in the ecclesia there, we, we weren't there, we don't know, know all the facts. I can't imagine it was the whole ecclesia, uh, but it was certainly disrupting the ecclesia and it was a matter that Paul felt he must address because he found it improper and inappropriate, even shameful for them to be behaving in such a way. We'll come back to what exactly it means praying and prophesying uh, in our second session. So I, it's no great finale there, but uh, we'll, we'll call it quits at that point and come back in our second session. Thank you. about the, the importance for us as individual brothers and sisters and as an ecclesia to come together with purpose and to know why we do what we do and to try and honour the ritual of 1 Corinthians 11 not out of habit but because of our personal commitment, our personal commitment to and conviction about the positive spiritually uplifting principles involved in this section. We just want to Reiterate that that's really important, and if you remember nothing else from our session today, it'd be good to reflect on that down the track. I've encouraged us to sort of get away from the perhaps the distracting, nitpicky kind of arguments that we can debate, um, or focusing on some of the, the negative aspects which we might feel worrious about this whole idea. Uh, get away from that and have a different perspective. Let's just try and have a just a simple, childlike humility to the traditions received by the apostles from the Lord and passed on to us. Let's 
have that appreciation that the, the rich spiritual symbology of the head covering and uncovering practice actually enriches us as a community. It enriches us. We're, we're the better for it. It doesn't diminish us. It builds us all up in our most holy faith. And it might be small, but it is indeed a significant reminder each meeting of the headship of Christ reminds us of the glory of God and the submission of the Ecclesia to our beloved Lord. And these, of course, are matters of high principle on which we'd all agree. And it's important for the Ecclesia as a whole, both men and women and brothers and sisters. So we left off our consideration last class, uh, last session talking about um, what was actually going on on the floor of the Ecclesia and we suggested um, that the, the sisters or some sisters within the Ecclesia seem to be losing this perspective of um, their, their role, their place in that divine hierarchy because they were engaging in prophesying, the, the, the miraculous gift of prophesying alongside some of the brothers. Um, and alongside that sort of changing attitude, if you like, um, they were setting aside the, the head covering as part of their, their growing independence from the man. And Paul was concerned uh, that this not continue, and his, he addresses that uh, in this section. It's interesting to, to, to notice actually where he starts, isn't it? He's obviously, we've also got a fair bit to still get through tonight, so uh, we'll, we'll move forward. Where does Paul start with his addressing this? We've, we've looked at verse 3 in some detail. We notice in verse 4, he starts probably not where, we, where we'd expect him to start. And I have to say, in most of the conversations I have in and around this, um, this subject, it seems to me that we, we kind of forget the other half of the picture. More than often, we're talking about one side of, of, of the principle of their discussion. We're not actually talking about the other. He starts with the uncovering of the head by man. That's where he starts, the uncovering of the head by by man. So, he, brothers, he starts with us in verse 4. See the balance here? The, the uncovering of the head of the man goes together with the covering of the head of the woman. There are two complementary actions going on here, symbolic actions, and they go together. Brothers and sisters are involved. Now, in our society today, men, you know, we, we perhaps don't tend to wear a head covering that much, you know, a, a cap or a, a hat, whatever. Perhaps not as much as they did in former times. If you th look at uh, photos going back to the 30s, um, last century, the 1930s and 40s, you, you see photos of, of society or community, and the men are wearing top hats just across the, across the board. Everyone's wearing hats, um, almost routinely. Down at the cricket, in the city, you, know, you, you see pictures of these people, and they're all, the, the men are more than often in public dressed with a hat on. Less so today, of course. You'd have to say less so today unless it's, it's a hat for the sun or perhaps a beanie for the cold if you live up the hill. So the uncovered head, brothers, may not receive much thought from us from one week to another as a symbolic thing, but it should. It should. And I think this actually should be part of our conversation a lot more than perhaps it is. And where occasion arises in, a, in these in ecclesia sort of gatherings that we've talked about, particularly the memorial meeting, and we are wearing a hat or a cap, then we ought to remove it. So, brothers, he starts with us in verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonours his head. The NASB says, disgraces his head. If we wear a head covering whilst praying or prophesying, that is, passing on God's message, prophesying, we dishonour our literal head, which symbolises Christ. He is our head. We dishonour him. That's what verse 4 tells us. We dishonour Christ. Rather than cover or hide Christ and his glory, we're actually trying to do the opposite in the Ecclesia, aren't we? We're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to exalt Christ, to promote him, to acknowledge and respect his authority. And then in verse 5, he turns to the, the, the other part of the story, which is the women. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoureth her head. So he turns to the women and he says she is to cover her head and she is to cover the glory of man, her head. She is to cover the glory of man. She is the glory of man, the end of verse 7 tells us. Very important expression at the end of verse 7. But the woman is the glory of the man. So she is to, to cover this glory. She's given beautiful long hair as we read of in verse 15. This is, is this a glory to her? And, and the head covering goes on that hair and covers that. 
So she covers the glory of man, her head. Not to do so in a closure dishonours and disgraces her head, the man, and hence his head, Christ, and ultimately God. It works up the chain, doesn't it? If you, if you bring disgrace on the man, it's disgrace on his head, that is Christ, and ultimately it's disgrace toward God. You're dishonouring God. The last expression in verse 5 is, for that is even all one, as if she was shaven, perhaps uh, a bit clunky in the AV. The New King James Version says, for that is one and the same, as if her head were shaved. For that is one and the same, as if her head was shaved. I think this is a simile, you know, like an expression like, he could run like the wind. It's a simile. The point or the element of comparison is the shame and the dishonour. Just as it's a shameful thing for a woman to have no hair, I mean, she's devoid of her glory in the terms of verse 15, if she has no hair. I mean, think how cancer sufferers, for example, feel about losing all their hair during chemotherapy. Just as it's a shameful thing for a woman to have no hair, she feels that shame. So it's a shameful thing for a sister not to cover her head in ecclesia. I think that's what he's saying. She's the glory of man. But no man ought to glory in the presence of God or his exalted son. Man is in humble submission to Christ, seeking to exalt Christ, allowing the, the glory of Christ to shine, not his own glory. And verse 6 extends the thought, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. I mean, what woman would be content to be shorn? Think of the Holocaust, where countless thousands of Jewish women were shamed and humiliated by being completely shorn. Sure, in society today, we get the odd exception, don't we? We do find the odd bod who, where a woman is happy to be shorn, but they're probably few and far between. It's a personal fashion choice of very few, but it's not the norm, is it? So Paul says, you wouldn't come at being shaven because of the shame and the embarrassment. You wouldn't come at that. You'd have to be forced to go down that road. Well, neither should you come at being uncovered in prayer or prophesying because of the shame and the embarrassment. Um, in relation to the shame and the embarrassment, this is probably a, um, a bit of an aside here. Sorry, I should be following these uh, slides. Um, there's some Old Testament references which may be, may be of interest to us. It's probably a diversion. Um, Numbers 5 and verse 18, the, the law of jealousy, where a wife... Um, was, was uh, suspected of unfaithfulness to her husband and the husband brought her to the judges. The woman's hair was uncovered or let down. Uh, possibly she was guilty of adultery. They had to determine that. Um, just some interesting um, other, other links to the, the unclean lepers who had to let their hair loose. It wasn't covered. Um, Isaiah 3 and 24, the captives with their, with their bald, bald heads, it is an obvious a, a, a position of shame which they would seek to avoid. Now, some commentators see in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5 and 6 there an allusion to the shaving of the hair of immoral women in Roman society at the time. And Paul's point is that no godly woman would want to be associated with that kind of, that kind of fashion. But be that as it may, you'd have to say Paul doesn't comment on that directly here. We'd have to be reading into to what he says, which may be, may be valid. It may just be a distraction. He comes into, I think, what's an important section. That's the reasons from Scripture. So, you know, he's given us, given us some instructions, as we've seen. He also has given us some reasons. Um, and he's, the first reasons he, he comes to are the reasons from Scripture. All right? Verse 7, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. And so we've seen that he goes back to creation before the fall, before the fall, and it's important to observe that that's the case. This happened right back there in the beginning. Man is to be uncovered in his worship because he is the image and glory of God. Of God, And we can't help but make the, the link, the connection back to Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, the formation of man, where man was made in the image and the likeness of the Elohim. Man was like no other created creature, was he? He was, he was the pinnacle of God's creation, having resemblance to the creator and relationship with him. And man was supposed to manifest, man was supposed to reflect the glory of God. 
But Adam failed to do this. He failed to manifest God's image and glory. But it wasn't left there, was it? God brought the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. In Psalm 8, verse 5 and 6, which is cited in Hebrews 2, as we know, Psalm 8, verse 5 and 6 speak, don't they, of, of, of this new one who would come and who would have dominion over all things. And it's a reference to Christ. It's an allusion back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, but, but the psalm speaks of Christ who would come in due time, who would truly be in the image and the glory of God. Where Adam had failed, Jesus Christ would not fail. He would very much be the centre of God's new spiritual creation. He would truly be the image and the glory of God. And so the man's head, in, in, terms of, in the terms that Paul uses here in chapter 11, the man's head, Christ, is truly the image and the glory of God. Can I have a couple of people read out some, the two references there, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, if someone could read that for us, and Colossians 1 and verse 15. All right, so where Adam failed, the Lord didn't fail, did he? He was the image and the glory of God, and he is man's head. And someone got 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. Thank you. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, be shine unto them. Thank you. And Colossians 1.15. It is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. All right, all right. So, you know, this is this is the the expression, the magnificent manifestation of the glory of God that ought not to be symbolically covered. This glory shouldn't be covered symbolically within the ecclesia. Believers are supposed to be continually conforming and changing and growing into this this very glorious image and likeness of Christ. Romans eight twenty nine, Second Corinthians three verse eighteen. If we could, Perhaps a couple of other people could read those passages for us. Just We know these verses, but it's good just to bring them to mind. Could someone find Romans 8, 29? It's not far from where we are, as you could flick back there. Romans 8. Twenty-nine. Does someone want to read that out for us? Thanks, Henry. So, I mean, the verse is pointing us to this, this, uh, this glory, um, this glorious image and likeness of, of, of Christ is not to be covered, it's to be exalted. In fact, the whole direction of our lives is supposed to be conforming and growing in this glorious image and likeness of Christ. Uh, we'll leave 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, speaks in similar terms. All right, so... So we seek to promote, don't we? We seek to exalt, to respect the image and the glory of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Men or brothers symbolically do this in ecclesia by worshipping uncovered. And just reflect for a moment, brothers, as, as we symbolically enact these principles in, in the ecclesia, what, respons what responsibility the, the man, the brethren have to sincerely reflect Christ in word and in deed in this place. It's a, it's a big responsibility for us, isn't it? You know, this is sort of something we should set ourselves to, to try and live up to as brothers to sincerely reflect Christ in word and deed in this place as we worship with our head uncovered in all of our relationships and in all of our interactions here. So these indeed are high and lofty principles. At the end of... Uh, Verse 7, if we go back to 1 Corinthians 11, he then says, But the woman is the glory of the man. The woman is the glory of the man. Well, in what sense is she the glory of the man? Women or sisters are to cover their heads because she is the glory of man. I think verse 8 and 9 are the, the explanation of what he means by that. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So in verse 8, he, he's making the point, perhaps firstly, and this is perhaps clarified in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 13, where it's uh, said very, very directly, Adam was first formed, then Eve. That's uh, 1 Timothy 2 verse 13. But that's certainly implied here at the beginning of uh, verse 8. Man came first in creation. So we think about the, the order of creation. But then the actual manner of the creation comes into play. Verse 8. She was derived or formed from man. 
we know in Genesis 2, verse 21 and 22. And that's an amazing moment in time, an incredible moment in time for the man, for Adam. And you know, it'd be hard to really fully comprehend what it, what it would have meant to him uh, as a man to, to come around from his unconscious state and to see this incredible second human being, something that was so special, something that was so beautiful, so precious to him, created from him, from man, to be a helpmate for him. An incredible moment in time. She was derived or formed from man. That's a special and a unique thing. And verse 9, the point is, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. She was created for the man to be a helpmate for him, to pick up the terms of Genesis 2, verse 18 and verse 20 to 22. Not the other way around. She was created for man, a helpmate for him. So the principles of headship outlined in verse 3 were ordained from the very beginning. And the creation of a second human after the first, from the first, and for the first, served only to exalt the glory of the first, the man, who God ordained as head of the woman. So he says she's to wear a covering on her head because she is the glory of man. The woman is the glory of the man. We're thinking about what the sense of that expression is. You know, I'd also make the observation that men and husbands still glory in women today, don't they? Very much so. Just as Adam did in Eve when she was brought, first brought to him at that moment of creation. You know, that's true in the world today. It's also true in the ecclesia. Too often in the world, when we think about the, the relationship between men and women in the world, too often the fact is in, in the outside that man's pride in woman takes a perverted and a shallow animalistic sort of form. And I'm not talking about this. But brothers, look around the, the rows that you're sitting in this, today here or in other ecclesias you might happen to be in. Just have a look around and observe our sisters, young and old, married and unmarried perhaps your own partner. Do we not often glory in them? I'm talking to the brothers, the brethren. Don't we have great pride in their amazing capacity for love, for service, comfort, care, compassion, you name it, sacrifice, selflessness, courage, perseverance? We see it all, don't we, amongst the, the sisters of our ecclesias. We could go on and on. We as men and brothers stand so much taller, don't we? We stand so much taller, so much surer for the presence of the many faithful women who surround us in the ecclesia. She is the glory of man, Paul says, and I think in a very real sense we experience that from day to day. You know, it'd be interesting to extend this thought further to consider how the ecclesia, uh, representing, represented by the woman, is the glory of Christ, the man. And that's an interesting thought to, to pursue, but we won't do it tonight. Coming back to the simplicity of the end of verse 7 there, the simplicity of it. In symbol, the glory of man is covered when the woman covers her head in enclosure, that the glory might be to God and to his exalted Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. A useful quote from the, uh, the book, The Challenge of Corinthians. When the practice of head coverings for sisters is questioned, it is usually on the basis that in Christ, both men and women are equal. But it will be seen that from Paul's comments, that, sorry, it will be seen from Paul's comments that this is not the issue. He does not speak about equality and inequality between men and women, but about the differences between divine and human glory. God is elevated, he says, when both brethren and sisters seek only to reverence him and to subdue human pride. Brethren appearing bareheaded and sisters covering their heads in communal worship are marks of these attitudes. So we come to verse 10, which is uh, an old chestnut, really. Um, even before uh, tea tonight, we had quite an interesting discussion and some, some really good thinking and comments in around this verse by, by people who have thought about these things long and hard. For this cause, he says in verse 10, ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. It seems an, an obscure expression, doesn't it? Power on her head. What does it mean that the woman ought to have power on her head? Well, I think it's useful to parallel the expression 
to an expression in verse 7. In verse 7 we have the phrase, a man indeed ought not to cover his head. He ought not to cover his head. Parallel that with what we have here in verse, verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. When you compare those two very similar expressions, it shows that to have power on her head in verse 10 is another way of saying the woman ought to cover her head. Notice if you've got the AV, the margin says that is a covering in sign that she is under the power of her husband. It's similar to many other versions. I'll read some of these versions. The New American Bible. It is a woman's duty to have a sign of authority on her head. The ESV. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. The New King James. The woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. So quite consistently it's taken uh, this way by some of the, um, you know, the reasonable translations that we have available to us. The word power is, is, of course, the word that we came across last night. Uh, we saw it a number of times there, and we tried to, to highlight that out of chapter 9. Verse 4, for example, have we not power? We, we, we use the expression right. Have we not the right to eat and to drink? Have we not power, verse 5 of chapter 9, to lead about a sister and a wife? Um, and so on. Verse 12, if, if others be partakers of this power or this authority or this right, if you like, over you, are we not the rather? Don't, don't we also have this, this power or this, this right? So it's used quite a number of times in, in, this, in this context. And it, was, it would seem, in my, in my view, to reflect verse 3, the order of authority, the delegated authority that was ordained by God. But we have God, we have Christ, we have man, and we have woman. And, and the, the, the authority is delegated down the chain. The head of the woman is the man. The woman is in submission to the man. It's a beautiful reflection, I think, of Christ, the man, being the head of the ecclesia, the woman. Or the ecclesia, the woman, being in submission to Christ, the man. The head covering is a sign of the woman's acceptance of God's arrangements, which ultimately serves to glorify God and Christ. In the image of God, just this passage, this quote here, the actions are symbolic. I thought this is well put. The actions are symbolic for male and female. The outward expression, the outward expression of an inward orientation to the will of God and an acceptance from the heart of his arrangements. Uh, I'll just mention here that uh, Uncle Peter was uh, making some good comments out of this verse uh, before the break and he, he was talking about the, the sense of this word, Greek word exousia. Uh, also has this idea of privilege. Um, it's actually the, the, the privilege for the woman to, to, to choose to submit and to signify her attitude in this sort of way, um, that the authority is actually hers. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting line of thought and, and a good one to, to think about more. Um, I'm sure Uncle Pete, he's still here. he he give you a very, very rational um, explanation of that if you uh, chase him up afterwards. Um, it's really, it's really honing on, on the sense of the word power or exousia as, as having the idea of um, the privilege, the privilege of, and it's, the authority is hers to, to choose or not to choose to do this. It's worth thinking about. Um, now, the next obvious question from the verse is because of the angels. Because of the angels? Well, why is this? Like, um, this is an additional reason, isn't it, to those given in verse 7, 8, and 9, and the NIV picks that up. The NIV says of this verse, for this reason and because of the angels, such and such. Right. So this is an additional reason given uh, above and beyond verse 8, 9 and 10, which we've already talked about. Because of the angels. Well, the context being creation. I mean, without any dispute, the context is creation, verse 7, 8 and 9. Um, this being the case, it seems the most likely, the, the, the most likely thing is that it has to do with the angels that had everything to do with the creation of man and woman in Genesis 1 and 2 and the events that unfolded thereafter. All right. We're in the context of creation. Surely the mention of angels would have relation back to that, the angels that were there in the very beginning who were involved in the formation of man and woman and everything that happened after that point. It was the Elohim, wasn't it, who created Adam and Eve at the command of God, who spoke to Adam the commandment, who witnessed Adam and Eve disregard God's arrangement and sin as they aspired to be equal to the angels. 
It was the angels that confronted Adam and Eve in the garden, as we know. They, they sought them out, they confronted them, and they said to the woman, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That's the angels back there in Eden. Well, these same angels, brothers and sisters and young people, these same angels are ministering spirits to all brothers and sisters of the new creation, having the same keen interest in the respect that we show to God's arrangements for us, just as they had for Adam and Eve back in the garden. And we possibly don't give a lot of thought from time to time about their, their daily presence amongst us in the ecclesia and outside. So to me, that simply must be the sense of that expression, because of the angels. But there's a very, very important caveat that he throws in here from verse 11, and we want to emphasise and highlight how important this is in verse 11 and 12. In the Lord, brothers and sisters are codependent. They rely on each other. They need each other. I think it's important to highlight this caveat because too often it's this section, particularly verse 3, um, that is viewed with concern about the, the control, the, the dominion that man seeks to have over women or that they might seek to exercise over women. Don't get me wrong, Paul says here. Don't get me wrong. There is a wonderful and necessary cooperation and mutual dependence between men and women, between brothers and sisters in the Lord. And again, out of verse 10, people balk at that. They think, well, this is, this is leading down a, a, a pathway which has created a problem for women for, for generations, you know, from domestic abuse to all sorts of other things that have gone on because of this, this wrong attitude, man see, seeking to exercise control and dominion over the woman based on you know, their misunderstanding of verses like verse 10. Um, there is potentially angst and concern about the ramifications of this. But no, says Paul, let's be quite clear. Let's be quite clear. This is no licence or excuse for men to exercise dominion and control. That's not the spirit of it whatsoever. So I think verse 11 and 12 are quite strategically placed in the context here. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman, the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Nevertheless, see that there? It's worth emphasising that. Nevertheless, this is an important balancing statement that he makes. And to pick up the ESV, in the Lord, this is of uh, verse 11, in the Lord, women, women are not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is also now born of woman, and all things are from God. You know, there's an obvious interdependence in the ecclesia, as was the case in creation. Eve came from Adam, as we know, but all subsequent males were born of women. What foolishness it would be in any way to diminish or to look down on or to devalue or discount the crucial role that women and sisters play. And to extend this thought further, just consider that our Lord Jesus, the saviour of all mankind, was a man styled the seed of the woman, wasn't he? In Genesis 3, verse 15, he's he styled the seed of the woman. He was made of a woman. Galatians 4, verse 4 tells us he was made of a woman. So I think verse 11 and 12 is very important to emphasise. Head covering and uncovering is not about sig signalling superiority or dominion or the right to control. It's not. We all, both brothers and sisters, have important God-given roles to play by which we glorify him from whom we all come. And there's a wonderful and so necessary cooperation and mutual dependence between men and women and brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I've got to say that in my experience, I see this cooperation and mutual dependence in the Lord all the time in my own ecclesia, and no doubt it's true down here at Cumberland as well. So then he turns to other reasons from verse 13 to 15. He changes tact. Having provided reasons from creation, which we might say are scriptural reasons or, scripture, or reasons from ancient history, all right, so he's gone back in time, he's, he's referenced scripture, he's talked about historical events. Well now, in verse 13 to 15, he's really talking about the here and now. He now appeals to their own contemporary judgment that it's not fitting, it's not proper for a woman to pray uncovered, as he says there in verse 13. Verse 13. 
And then he references nature, doesn't he, in verse 14 and verse 15. The self-evident natural way of things as a further support for his injunction that women ought to worship with their heads covered and men with their head uncovered. So he says in verse 13, Judge for yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Judge for yourselves. Is it comely? I mean, it's a rhetorical question, surely. I mean, he's clearly saying it's not comely. That's his point. It isn't comely. It's not suitable or proper or fitting for a woman to pray with her head uncovered. Now, this might not resonate, resonate with the average Aussie today in what is an increasingly atheistic society. But back in Paul's day, with the strong cultures of pagan worship which existed around him, the pagan worship of the gods by the Romans and the Greeks, and the entrenched worship practices of the Jews. The covering of the head for worship by women was commonplace. It was. It was commonplace back then, and even by men in some cultures. So there was a readily discernible acceptance in the society of the day from which believers were drawn that a head covering for worship was fitting. And I think that's what he's driving at there in verse 13. But just please remember again, we're not suggesting that Paul is laying this down in verse 3 to 16 in deference, in deference to existing pagan or Jewish custom. I don't think he is. He's not trying to placate the Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, or any other customs of the day. He's laying down what became a, a Christian custom. Verse 14 to 15, he turns to nature. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering. So he turns to nature, the, the natural way, the natural order that would be observable and true from one generation to another, from one nation to another. So you observe these things in any society, in any time. The natural way. Verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a shame unto him. In most societies through time, including our own until perhaps recent decades, for men to have long hair was improper or shameful. Something that confused the natural distinction between the sexes, something that God himself strongly disapproved of. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5, we know that reference, something that God strongly approved of. He always approved the, the distinction of the sexes. Don't think about the exceptions. Like we might think, oh, hang on, uh, the Nazarites had long hair. You know, there can't be anything wrong with having long hair. The Nazarites was, was obviously an exception to a rule. They were doing something that was out of the ordinary. And at the end of their vow, they shaved the hair, the hair off and perhaps had a more ordinary uh, hairstyle, if you like, for, for men. Or the, the Spartans in ancient times, you know, they, they were known for their, their long hair. All right? the, the norm, the, think of the, the general picture here. Men generally have not had long hair because long hair was improper or shameful from them. There's something that belonged to the other sex. Verse 15, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. For the woman, or the female, uh, it's them who typically has the longer, more ornate hair. Her hair is commonly a glory to her in a way that is not typical of men. I mean, I'd forward my own household an example of the natural way. The natural way. If you were to rate my hair alongside that of the four women under my roof, Carolyn, Phoebe, Sophie and Ruby, if we were to rate them one to five, where would my hair rate? Well, five to be sure, be right down the bottom. Not so glorious, not so beautiful, thinning, balding. I mean, men tend to wear their hair shorter for obvious reasons, don't they? You know, the, the glory with the hair lies with the woman. That's, that's, that's the natural understanding uh, through the ages in most societies. It's not hard to understand what Paul is saying here. So... Where is the glory of man commonly and normally demonstrated? Well, it's on the head of the sisters. Her hair is given her for a covering, that verse says. And we saw that that word covering is different to that in earlier verses. The Greek means something that's thrown around, like a mantle or a veil or a covering. It gives a sense that the woman's beautiful hair is like an ornament, a beautiful dress item that God has given to her. And so it's upon this that the covering goes. Veiling the glory of man that God alone might be glorified. 
We ask another question. Does head covering or uncovering only apply when involved in the act of praying or prophesying? Do we even have prophesying in the Ecclesia today? We first notice that there's a slight difference in verse 4 and verse 13. Uh, verse 4 uh, and 5 speak of praying, you know, both of praying and prophesying, uh, whereas verse 13 speaks of praying, praying only. If we think about prophesying, it's evident from chapter 11 to 14 that the spirit gift of prophesying was in use in Corinth, and it's also evident that God used both brothers and sisters as vehicles of his message. There were women prophets, there were sisters prophesying um, using the, the, the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. So both brothers and sisters were prophesying in the ecclesia, and we're not going to comment on the, the tension or the apparent tension between verse 4 and chapter 14, verse 34 tonight. That's not our subject here. We believe that the miraculous gift of prophesying ceased to be in use much beyond the times of the apostles, and would perhaps reference chapter 13 and verse 8, um, you know, the, the great chapter of love, which, which ends up saying that you know, they, these things like prophesying, they had their day, they had their place, but ultimately they'll be usurped by something that's far superior, love. So the miraculous gifts of prophesying ceased to be in use much beyond the time of the apostles. However, in a very real sense, I believe, prophesying, that is, forth telling the word of God, prophesying continues in our gatherings today, certainly at each memorial meeting where the, the word of God is opened and the word of God is preached. For reasons that we won't go into tonight, this public preaching or teaching in our ecclesias, this role generally falls to the brothers, doesn't it? It falls to the brothers. My point here is that, in a real sense, prophesying continues in the ecclesia today. So prophesying, uh, as it's mentioned in verse 4 and 5, and Paul's instructions around it retain a relevance in today's ecclesia. Prophesying is, in, in my view, a, a real thing today. It still happens, and so Paul's instructions around that, uh, earlier on in this chapter, uh, retain a, relevant to us, a relevance to us in our ecclesias today. When it comes to praying... We find it's mentioned in both verse 4 and 5 and verse 13. This is different, isn't it? This is us speaking to God in Ecclesia. It's not, it's not one of the miraculous gifts. This is us speaking to God in Ecclesia. Which sometimes is led by a brother, isn't it? Think of these two scenarios. Sometimes it's led by a brother speaking publicly whilst the rest of us rehearse the words in our head. In a sense, we're all praying. So the brother is praying, as Chris did earlier on. And all of us, brothers and sisters here assembled, are listening to Chris and we're rehearsing the words in our heads. Um, we are all praying and at the end, I will often all say amen. We're all involved in that prayer. Or the other scenario might be um, commonly in the, uh, the memorial meetings, we take this time for meditation as we partake of the emblems and, and quietly, silently, we're praying, aren't we? As, we, as we reflect on our lives before God in the context of the emblems. Um, just turn over to 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. I think we've got uh, time for this. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. It seems to be a very clear injunction. We're probably quite familiar with this, but um, maybe for some of the young people, if you're not that familiar with this verse, just, just have, a, have a note of this one. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. It's talking about the fact that God... Uh, would expect that prayer in public be led by the brothers, the, the brethren. It seems to be quite a clear injunction in this verse. And, of course, this is generally our custom. I will, therefore, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And then he also has something to address to the women or the sisters, and he does that in verse 9. So he seems the men are the focus of his comment in verse 8. The women are at the focus of his comment in verse 9. Verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. All right, that's, that's his instruction in that place. It appears to be, as I would understand it, a very clear injunction that public prayer is to be led by men and brothers. And I think it's unlikely that there's a, a contradiction here between 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8 and 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5, which we've considered, where we read of women praying or prophesying. I wouldn't think that she was 
leading the congregation in prayer in that public sense, but certainly involved in prayer in both those senses uh, that we've already referred to. But, you know, even if this is disputed and you felt that she was, the sisters were in Corinth standing on their feet and leading the ecclesia in prayer, um, the fact is that the act of praying for sisters and brothers continues in the ecclesia today in the ways that we've already talked about, just as it did in Paul's day. And so if the, if the principle of head covering and uncovering applied then with prayer, why not today? Why wouldn't it apply today? Some feel that the, the head covering should only go on or come off uh, just for the moment, just for the moment of prayer or for the moment of, of prophesying the, the foretelling of the word of God. Um, seems an impractical kind of idea. Do we imagine head coverings on and off, on, then off, throughout a meeting in ecclesia as prayer stop, starts and then stops and then starts again, stops, prophesying starts, stops? It seems unlikely, an unlikely scenario, doesn't it? And if the covering and the uncovering of heads based on our acceptance of God's arrangements serves to the veiling of the glory of man and the exaltation of the glory of Christ in our God, then why wouldn't we seek to maximise this? Why would we be seeking to limit the practice of this, of this symbolic head covering to just those short moments of prayer? We wouldn't. We wouldn't really be driven to, to limit it or to minimise it. So the practice of covering and uncovering the head for the duration of worship in the ecclesia seems like a sound idea. And that tends to be our custom. So we come back to verse 16, which we commented on earlier on. But if any man seem to be contentious, Paul concludes, we have no such custom, neither the, neither the ecclesias of God. Paul didn't want to see contention going on about head covering city. He? he says, we have no other custom. You know, I'm not, I can't prevent some alternative, present some alternative to you. I, me and the, the other apostles, we don't have alternative novel ideas which, which uh, we're happy for you to introduce. We, we've told you the way it is. We have no other practice, the NIV says. We have no other practice. They didn't recognise or recommend alternative practices within the ecclesias. And neither, he says, do the ecclesias of God. Talking about all the other ecclesial centres. The apostles' outline of the wearing and the non-wearing of head coverings was broadly accepted and practiced in other ecclesial centres. It's, it's just, it seems, the Corinthians who are out of step with apostolic ordinance. Now, some take verse 16 as Paul saying, look, at the end of the day, we, we don't want any strife about this. You know, the, the, the highest principle is no strife. We don't, we don't want arguments. Um, it's not that important. If you can't work it out harmoniously, so be it. We, we don't want strife over it. Well, we can be sure that Paul and the Apostles didn't want strife about it. We can all be sure, sure of that. But neither has Paul spent all this space in Corinthians outlining the practice and the principles passed on by the Lord, only to conclude at the end that it's not that important, don't quarrel about it. He laid the foundation principle, didn't he, in verse 3, and he's built up carefully, he's built up um, step by step, he's built his case. From there, and at no point has he hinted it's a take it or a leave it kind of matter. Which uh, brings me to really the last little section here, um, and we could sort of take take it or leave it as far as this is concerned. This is interesting. I haven't sort of spent any time uh, opening this up for today's presentation, but it's worth thinking about. Um, like I say, many people have thought about this subject long and hard, and and people have at various um, really good thinking and, and useful thoughts about it worth, worth us considering. You know, a couple of things which have caught my attention over, over time um, is the fact that the woman represents the ecclesia. You know, that's a very biblical idea. The woman represents the ecclesia and the woman is covered by Christ's sacrifice. And they pick up this word covered. You know, it's a common Old Testament kind of uh, concept where, where sins are covered you know, by the, the blood of the animal and so forth. And so the, the thinking is that we approach God, we approach Christ on the basis of this covering of sin. So the woman is representing the ecclesia here. She's covered. She has this covering on. She's covered by Christ's sacrifice. And so because of this, all of us, uh, men and women, brothers and sisters, are able to approach God and Christ on the basis of that covering of sin. So it's an interesting idea and um, it's certainly worth thinking through. Another interesting thought which I've heard is that 
woman, the woman or the sister covers man her head and so gains direct access in worship to Christ his head. The woman covers man her head and so in a way kind of bypasses his authority and goes direct in worship to Christ his head. It's almost like he, she bypasses um, sort of one point of the chain there to go direct to Christ and so the, the man and the woman are both directly uh, involved in worship to, to God and to Christ their head. Um, I don't think these things are, you know, I, don't, I don't take this out of the, uh, the context or at least what Paul says here, but I think they're, they're, they're reasonable ideas that are, that are worth thinking about and certainly have formed um, part of people's meditation about. The preaching of the cross of Christ in Corinth was obviously hard work for Paul. It was hard work. You know, the very idea, the very concept of a man crucified in, in weakness, in shame and humiliation, somehow being a saviour or a victor, just didn't wash with the Greeks in Corinth. It just didn't cut it, did it? This one named Jesus that Paul talked about simply didn't fit their, their typical sense of what a hero would be. Paul comments on this in the first chapter of his first letter. Let's just turn back there. The cross of Christ. This is what he focused on when he came to Corinth. Let's just pick this up. It would be worth noting this uh, if you haven't before. Um, from verse 17 in chapter 1. For Christ sent me not to baptise but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And that's what he's preaching. That was the, the burden of his message. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. We come through to verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks, they look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. And in the second chapter, in chapter 1 and 2, he shows how he was very determined to preach this message. This is what he wanted to represent to the Corinthians. And I, brethren, when I came to you, chapter 2, verse 1, I didn't come with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so four times, I think, in these verses, it's impressed upon us that these are the things that Paul really wanted to convey in his words and in his manner of life amongst the Corinthians. You might turn back to Acts chapter 18, where we actually read of his preaching in Corinth. When we read of or think of the cross of Christ, Christ crucified, it conjures up the... Thoughts of sacrifice, doesn't it? Sacrifice, of awful suffering, of painful self-denial, of humiliation and death. Now this is the message. This is the, the, the burden of the message that Paul's, Paul's preaching in these places. I mean, none of those things I just mentioned are attractive propositions to the natural man, are they? They're all difficult ideas to process as, as somehow being good news for my life. The sort of thing that I should adopt as a pattern for my life. Are you serious, Paul? You want us to adopt the ethos of Christ crucified in our lives? Of course, the cross of Christ or Christ crucified also conjures up thoughts of a man doing all to the glory of God, of a man seeking the advantage of others, a defeat of sin, a covering for sin, a door of hope and eternal glory being opened for the many who might be saved through belief. But to the Greeks in Corinth, it was foolishness. It was, it was an absurdity, a ridiculous notion. To the Jew, it was an offensive thing that they just couldn't reconcile. Now, it's interesting when you read through Acts 18, and you'll be familiar with the record, the story of where he came to, came to Corinth, having been in Athens for some time on his own, it seems, and not particularly enjoying it. He comes maybe somewhat downhearted to Corinth, to this massive 
idolatrous city of the Greeks in verse 1 of chapter 18. And he found some good company there. We know he, he bumped into Aquila and Priscilla, verse 2. That would have been an excellent thing for him. They had a common interest in tent making, and so they dwelt together, as we read in verse 2 and 3. And Paul, as his custom was, verse 4, he went into the synagogue in Corinth every single Sabbath, week after week. He'd be back in there trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. But it wasn't going well. And it's interesting that when Silas, Silas and Timothy come to him in verse 5, when they were come from up north in Macedonia, we read that Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So he had Aquila and Priscilla with him to support him, but his regular preaching in the synagogue with this message of the cross of Christ was hard going. But fortunately, the coming of Silas and Timothy gave him a real boost and he doubled down and devoted himself completely to preaching the word. But by and large, the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogue are not impressed at all, as verse 6 tells us. They opposed him and reviled him and they basically forced him out of the synagogue to find some other place to preach. To Paul, it was a fruitless exercise to continue in that place, to continue beating his head against a brick wall, if you like, trying to preach in the synagogue. And so he moves to, it seems, the house next door, in verse 7, to the house of justice. Well, in that place, he started to see some fruit. Verse 8 would seem to indicate he started to, to make some ground. You see, he started to see some fruit for his labour, but it wasn't easy going. And the fact it wasn't easy going is, is underscored or underpinned by the fact that in verse 9 and 10, he receives a special vision. This didn't happen every night, but in this place, at this time, he, respe he receives a special vision from the Lord who spake to Paul in, uh, at night time by a vision saying, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city, the Lord told him. So this is a special vision from the Lord in this, in this context. Paul needs encouragement and reassurance. Paul, there will be many who will come to appreciate and believe that the gospel of Christ crucified is not foolishness. It was indeed the power of God to salvation. And the many who did receive this message, of course, became our ancient brothers and sisters of the Corinthian Ecclesia. They accepted and were converted to the power of of the message of Christ crucified. Coming back to 1 Corinthians 11, coming back to this record, I try and picture Paul meeting and speaking with those who would listen with sincere interest. And he'd sit at their tables in their homes. He'd sit with them on the bench down at the marketplace or perhaps down at the tavern where he was eating a meal. He'd, he'd have people around the table with him there He'd be there in the house of justice with a group of people. And there he is, the Apostle Paul in Corinth, filling these people in with greater detail about this incredible message of the cross of Christ. And as an integral part of this, he would have conveyed to them, he would have taught them about the manner of the Last Supper. He would have passed on this tradition with all the drama of that upper room, certainly in a lot more detail than what we have it here in 1 Corinthians and chapter 11. That remarkably... He would have told them, remarkably, on, on the night of his very betrayal, whilst his very betrayer sat at the table with him, Judas was his name, this Lord Jesus, this one I'm preaching, took bread in the presence of his disciples. He took bread and he gave thanks for that bread, Paul would say. He gave thanks for the bread which spoke of his body, which so very soon would be broken in agonising death on the cross for them all given through crucifixion as a sacrifice to cover sins. This man, Jesus, Paul would have said, knew that this was going to happen. And he chose to submit to the suffering, to the humiliation, the shame. And Jesus, in the immensely crucial moments of, this last, of the Last Supper, is of a mind to actually thank God, to thank God for providing him as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And as he continued speaking, Paul would paint a very vivid picture, wouldn't he? He'd paint an extraordinary picture of this feast. He would impress upon them the spirit and the tone of what the breaking of bread should mean for a disciple keeping the feast thereafter. 
And I'm sure everyone who heard Paul repeat those traditions of the Lord's Supper back in those days would have been deeply impressed and deeply touched and motivated by the things that they had heard. As, any, as would any one of us, had we been sitting down with the Apostle Paul on that day and hearing him sharing that awesome account. And in the days that followed, as the Corinthian brothers and sisters first began to keep this feast on a weekly basis, in the weeks and the months after their conversion, often together, of course, with the Apostle Paul in company. That would have been a special thing. He would have been there with them through those, those early months. The memorial feast for them must have been an incredibly authentic and meaningful thing. It would have powerfully reflected Christ crucified. The traditions of the feast would have closely resembled that of the Last Supper. The spirit and tone of the activity would have reflected the spirit and tone that the Lord Jesus himself had imposed upon it. We notice in verse 20 that Paul uses that expression, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. In the original supper in the upper room, it was the Lord who put his stamp on the, on the proceedings. He set the tone, didn't he? For their part, the Corinthians may have made arrangements, and they did. They had to settle on a time for the memorial meeting. They had to settle on a venue. They would have appointed teachers. There would have been a, arrangements made for the provision of food, for the bread and the wine and so forth. But the Lord Jesus was the host of that feast and still is today, brothers and sisters. He still is today. We make arrangements here, don't we? All sorts of arrangements to bring together this meeting this morning. As per the syllabus, if you've no doubt you've got a syllabus and probably generally run by that. Brother Tim is the chairman this morning. An arrangement has been made. Someone has prepared the, the bread and the wine uh, before we got here this morning. Certain brothers will distribute the bread and wine. Sister Jane has played the organ for us this morning beautifully. Someone makes a record of who attends. Someone meets and greets at the door. And all these things. There's so many small arrangements to make up the whole. But for all that, brothers and sisters, it's not our memorial meeting. It's not our memorial meeting. It's not our feast. It's the Lord's. He draws us here. He is the host. He sets the spirit and tone of what we're doing here. We notice the constant reference to the Lord uh, from verse 17 to verse 34. I think it's about eight times. It's worth highlighting. He, he's, he looms large in this context, just as he looms large in our audience today. Yet, as compelling as Paul's preaching of the cross of Christ may have been, and it would have been amazing to hear him speak those things, and as tangible as the presence of the Lord of hosts, at, sorry, of the presence of the Lord as hosts would have been in those early days, they would have that, that keen sense that the Lord was with them, and that he was hosting that feast. Over a period of time, the memorial feast deteriorated in the Corinthian ecclesia. It lost its way and became something that was more damaging than a building for the Corinthian ecclesia. It's extraordinary, really, isn't it? I mean, we're quite incredulous when we read about what was going on there, that it could so deteriorate that it became more damaging than upbuilding to come to that memorial feast. It fell prey to all the human elements that have the potential to ruin and spoil what should be the highlight of our spiritual schedule. The, the very same human elements or traits that potentially can harm and our gatherings today, aren't they? Nothing's really changed through 2,000 years. To come together should have been a special and an uplifting thing, a unifying and reinforcing and comforting experience for all of them. There's a number of times where it talks about this coming together in this context. Verse 18, verse, uh, sorry, starting verse 17, verse 18. Verse 20, verse 33, verse 34, all of these times speak of this, of this idea of coming together, coming together. It's a special thing. It's a special opportunity to treasure. See, when we compare verse 20 and chapter 14, verse 23, which talks about when the whole ecclesia comes together, we get the clear inference that there was many times where the, the whole of the, the, the brothers and sisters in Corinth were not able to be together. It wasn't the rule that they were all together in this way. They would have had problems with finding a convenient time to suit everyone or with transport or finding a suitable venue. All these things might mean that oftentimes they had to content themselves meeting in smaller groups and I'm sure they did. But in these special times when they came all together in a larger venue, all into one place for the memorial feast, it was to be 
for the better. And I pick up that expression from the end of verse 17. It should have been about coming together for the better. That should have been the outcome. That should have been the result for them all. For the best. To make them stronger. It's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Coming together for the better. To make them stronger. And it's worth remembering that phrase, that expression. Tuck it away in the back of our minds when I'm well enough to attend, but I'm thinking about staying home to live stream the meeting. Or I'm thinking, as sometimes I do, just to stay at home and have a meeting by myself or ourselves at home. Or choosing some other activity instead of the memorial meeting, as sometimes we do. So we're thinking about this idea of coming together for the best. This is the best. This is the best outcome we can look for. The Apostle Paul is recommending to all of us that it is for the best, it is for our strengthening that we join with the whole ecclesia to, to share the Lord's Supper. And I'm sure we'd all agree that generally, generally, this is our experience. We do find this. Yes, at times we might pine for something new, something a bit fresh, something less formalised. Not all the hymns might be our favourites. The theme of the exhortation may not always grab us. Yes, at times we're feeling a bit introverted or disconnected or mentally flat and unwell or we're experiencing some tension in our relationships with other people here. But far better, far better to be together in ecclesia and to be separate, to be apart. I think that's what Paul is telling us here. Well, incredibly, the Corinthian experience now was, at least at the time when Paul was writing this letter, their experience was that the memorial feast was doing more harm than good. It had lost its values. Its tone and spirit had, de had degenerated. Those human elements we, we alluded to had conspired to drag it down. We know the basic story, don't we? There was a divide within this, within this ecclesia between rich and poor, the haves and the have-nots at the memorial feast. In their meal, which was associated with the feast, the wealthy had an abundance of food and wine, and they merrily set off to indulge themselves with seemingly hardly a second thought for their poor brothers and sisters, some of them slaves, who had next to nothing. The result being incredibly, verse 21, that some were hungry, but on the other hand, some were drunk in the same room. Verse 22 says they were despising the ecclesia of God, of God. God's ecclesia, not theirs. They were despising his ecclesia and shaming and humiliating other brothers and sisters. No, this was no longer the Lord's Supper. This was something else. It was no longer a powerful reminder of Christ crucified. It was a mile away from the cross of Christ and a blunt rejection of the host of the feast, the Lord. They were, as verse 26 says, they were supposed to be proclaiming, to be openly declaring to anyone who might listen, that their Lord had died for them. But their actions here at their feast betrayed that they were doing no such thing. The terrible reality of it all was that in the Lord's eyes, in the terms of verse 27, many of them were eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. They were eating and drinking in an unworthy manner and were guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Something no brother and sister would ever want to be guilty of. They were guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, as if they were siding in some way with Judas. They were with Judas. They were siding with the Romans and the Jews who conspired to kill the Lord, to bring down the Lord Jesus. They were eating and drinking in an unworthy manner and were guilty in that sense of the body and blood of the Lord. Speaking of coming together for the worse... Verse 29 indicates, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eats and drinks condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The very act of eating and drinking wine, whilst we are thinking of behaving in a way which is unfit, invites judgment from the Lord upon us. That's what that verse says. It invites judgment from the Lord upon us because it's an affront to him. It's a desecration of the, more, of the memorial feast that he's hosting for the betterment of, of his brothers and sisters. In fact, as verse 30 outlines, the judgment of the Lord was already evident among them 
to the point that many of them were plagued by sicknesses. Some had even passed away. Verse 30. Just stop and think about that. We read this section of the New Testament perhaps more than any other section of Scripture. But let's not allow a familiarity with a form of words to dilute the drama and the weighty significance of what was happening here on the floor of this ecclesia. We might wonder or question whether the likes of verse 30 has any contemporary relevance to us. Yet surely none of us would doubt that our living Lord, we believe he's, he's alive, he's living, he's present with us. This living Lord who hosts this memorial feast. He hosts it in all ages, doesn't he? He was the host back in the time of the Corinthians. He is the host today. Remember that expression at the end of verse 26? You just show the Lord's death till he come. The Lord expected, he anticipated that it would be routine for his followers to be keeping this feast to the day that he came. No, brothers and sisters, he still retains a keen interest in this, in this uh, feast, doesn't he? He retains that interest as the host. And he wants to know, he wants to see what the spirit and the tone of our gatherings for remembrance are in Ecclesia today and this morning. And just as he acted in judgment against the Corinthians brothers and sisters to bring them to their spiritual senses, to bring them to repentance so that they wouldn't be condemned along with the ungodly in the world, as verse 32 says, this was his positive intent with them, to, to bring them back from the brink, to bring them back to, to what the feast was all about, to walk, I guess, in harmony with those things again, in harmony with him. Just as he acted in judgment back in those days, brothers and sisters, why wouldn't he? today our lord who lives and who walks among the ecclesias why wouldn't he be active in this way and for this cause today it's a sobering thought and i think it's worth our deep reflection it's a very subjective thing to determine if the lord's judgment for our good it's a very subjective thing to determine if the lord's judgment is apparent in our ecclesias today one brother might conclude differently to another, I'm sure. But it is very much worth reflecting on. The Lord didn't turn a blind eye to brothers and sisters spoiling and trampling the sanctity and the lofty spiritual values that he had stamped on the memorial feast. And he looks to each one of us this morning, to you and to me. He looks to us this morning and each week to come together with purpose, to come together for the better. Hence Paul's counsel in verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. In verse 28, the emphasis that Paul gives, gives is to the need for self-examination before we eat bread and wine. A verse which I frequently read, but much less frequently actually practice. As he, says, as he says elsewhere, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, same sort of idea. Examine yourselves, he says, in that place. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. This is the hardest thing to do, isn't it? It's the hardest thing to do. It's the easiest thing to bypass. It points to the need for us to come here mentally prepared before we walk in the door. Having already given some prayerful thought to the state of our lives, given some time, some time to introspection on our life habits, our motivations in the light of the example of Christ and the word of God. Maybe to have had a useful open conversation with someone close. You may not be a lot of time involved, but something, some time. I reckon there's probably quite a few of that kind of conversation going on uh, yesterday or on Friday night. A lot of conversation about our lives and, and, and how we're going. This is what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters. We, a bit of inward looking, a bit of introspection and examination of our lives, putting it on the table for, for a bit of exposure and a bit of assessment. You know, the 50 minutes of the memorial meeting or so that precedes the taking of the bread and the wine should help, shouldn't it? And I'm sure it does help us. But often in that time, we're going to be more focused collectively, one and all, on, a great, on the great spiritual and joyful truths rather than a careful 
a very personal examination of my day-to-day -day reality, the day-to-day -day reality of me in my life. Who am I? What am I about? We don't get a lot of time within that 50 minutes to, to really exhaust those sorts of thoughts. And really, the, the set time for meditation that we have when we eat the bread and then drink the wine, it's such a short moment in time, which we may or may not use to best effect anyway. I mean, how many times have we clocked out in the, uh, the, uh, after the exhortation where we might be slightly mentally fatigued, having listened to 40 minutes of presentation, and we take the bread and the wine, and actually we're not that mentally geared up at all um, as we close our eyes and sort of wait for the events to happen. We're not always sharp in those times, are we, brothers and sisters? We may not use that short time to best effect anyway. So Paul is exhorting us very, very clearly to come here mentally prepared with a mindset that we're going to be open and honest with the Lord before his table here. Of course, in a sense, we all feel unworthy, don't we? We all feel unworthy. That would be true for every single one of us. You might think when you read verse 27, well, that's just me. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. I feel, I feel this way every week. I feel I'm unworthy. It's just me. But, brothers and sisters, none of us came in here this morning holding up our banner of righteousness. Not one. None of us partake of the bread and the wine thinking that we deserve it. Yet incredibly, amazingly, by the grace of Almighty God, through Christ, each of us is reckoned as righteous before God on account of our faith. God has provided a covering for all of our sins. And so, despite our sense of unworthiness, which is real, despite that, we partake of the emblems. We, we participate here, don't we? We participate freely and thankfully. But the Lord seeks from us, doesn't he? He seeks something from us, and that is that we will come here with clear purpose. The Lord seeks from us that we will approach our participation in this feast with the right spirit and the right attitude so that our words and behaviour here will be in harmony with the things that we're here to remember. And so alongside self-examination, Paul exhorts us to discern the Lord's body in verse 29. He puts it in the negative in that verse. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh the condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not discerning it. But to look at it the other way around, to, in a positive sense, he's exhorting us that if we do rightly discern the Lord's body, we'll avoid the pitfall of partaking unworthily and bringing condemnation on ourselves. So therefore we give ourselves to self-examination, don't we? And also to discerning the Lord's body. But what does this mean? What does it mean to discern the Lord's body? The New International Version phrases it without recognising the body of the Lord. The New American Standard Bible says, if he does not judge the body rightly, if he does not judge the body rightly. The equivalent uh, word to discern, uh, the, the, the Greek word, we find that again in verse 31, as I'm sure you know, for if we would judge ourselves, that's the word, we should not be judged. If we would judge ourselves. Other versions say if we would judge ourselves rightly or judge ourselves truly. So the Greek word here, diakrino, means to separate, to judge between things, to discriminate, to distinguish. We find the word back there in Matthew chapter 16 where he talks about the fact that they could discern the weather, they could look at the signs in, in, in the sky with the clouds and, and the wind and so forth, they have a fair call on the way the, the weather is trending, whether it's going to be fair or, or rainy or whatsoever, they could discern those things. They could discriminate. They could distinguish between different weather patterns. We're being asked here to distinguish and to discriminate and to judge between when it comes to the Lord's body. The phrase, the Lord's body here, surely in context here, takes us back to verse 24, does it not? Is that the way we'd read that? We'd have to look within the context he's, he's spoken about his body. Take, eat, verse 24, this is my body which is broken for you. Surely within this immediate context, this is the meaning of the phrase. Again, verse 27, 
they will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. This is the body that was nailed to the cross as a sacrifice for sin, represented by the bread and wine this morning. This is Christ crucified. This is the cross of Christ which Paul committed himself to preach in Corinth, despite the fact that the Greeks and the Jews found it so difficult to receive. The Lord's body given for us conjures up thoughts of sacrifice, of awful suffering, of painful self-denial, of humiliation and of brutal death. It's not a cheery message. It doesn't come with attractive fame and earthly glory. It doesn't promise the best that this world can offer today. It doesn't promise a pathway of ease and relaxation. But receiving this message, brothers and sisters, receiving it and fellowshipping the Lord's sufferings is the pathway to eternal life and glory. And we're asked to rightly discern the Lord's body, to, to differentiate the Lord's body, and I think the blood, from all other things. From all other things. The things that this memorial bread represent are not ordinary things. These things are extraordinary. They're holy, they're separate from other things. They are special, they're different. And we are to think of them and respect them as such. And if we do, it's going to have a profound effect on the way that you and I personally engage with this feast from one week to another. You know, the Lord's body given for us has very little in common with much that consumes our ordinary lives. And we need to perceive and understand the difference, brothers and sisters and young people. Christ crucified has little to do with the AFL finals or with elite fitness. It has little in common with how well our house is decked out. It has little to do with our exotic holiday plans. It has little in common with parting and the indulgent consumption of good food, which is where the Corinthians went, went, went wrong. In fact, the cross of Christ has little in common with most of what the world would encourage us to desire and to pursue in our daily lives. The Lord's body given for us is different. It speaks of other things which gain no credence in our world, just as they did amongst the Jews and the Greeks that Paul tried to preach to in Corinth. So when we come together here, we need to come with purpose. We've used that word a lot this weekend. We need to come together with purpose. We need to engage with the, the depth of what this bread and wine represent. We need to engage with the, the profound ramifications that these things have had on the course of our lives up until now and will continue to have forever. It might be a routine. It might be predictable. It might sometimes feel like it's just a weekly spiritual habit. But we need to connect, don't we? We need to connect and keep reconnecting week by week with the gravity of all these things, the sobering truths that it proclaims of a saviour, our saviour, who loved each one of us and gave himself for us upon that tree. That henceforth you and I should not live to ourselves, but unto him that gave us, gave himself for us, and rose again. And you know, it doesn't have to be a spectacle, does it? It doesn't have to be a great show to achieve this for us. We don't need high performance. We don't need booming sound and an amazing light show to help us truly connect with these things. We don't need it. We're not here for entertainment, brothers and sisters. This isn't entertainment. The addition of these types of things won't particularly help us examine ourselves or rightly discern the Lord's body. It's a simple feast with simple rituals that speak of the most profound and the most meaningful truths that, that can be found anywhere upon the face of the whole earth. So we're called upon to, to differentiate to distinguish between the holy and the mundane and rightly discern the Lord's body that we might avoid the fearful scenario of eating and drinking judgment upon ourselves. But we ask the question, is there more 
Is there more to discerning the Lord's body than this? Whilst it's obvious in the immediate context to, to connect with the use of the word body in verse 24 and verse 27, as we've just been discussing, one can't help, can, can we, but, but see the link to the copious uses of this word, this very same word, in the next chapter that immediately follows, chapter 12, where the Lord's body is the ecclesia. The ecclesial body with its many and varied members, all having a part, a beneficial function within the body. Many members with varying needs for care and support. So here it is, brothers and sisters, we're in it. This is it this morning, we're sitting in it. Look around. Look around at the living, breathing body of Christ, the community of believers that we're sharing this memorial meeting with today. And of course, there are many others who are also an integral part of it who are not able to physically attend today. Or they meet in many other places near and far. You know, something like 18 times between verse 12 and 27 of chapter 12, we find a reference to the body. It's, it's a strong theme of that section, the body. Let's just pick it up in chapter 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptised into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into that one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And Paul proceeds to talk through these subsequent verses, doesn't he, about various things in relation to that body, about the, the many different members that make up the body, with all their unique yet crucial functions. He speaks of eyes and ears, noses and hands. He emphasises that God has quite deliberately set the members in the body by his design. They don't just sort of happen by chance. Amazing in verse 18 and verse 24 where that's, uh, that's um, illustrated. God deliberately designs and sets people as members of the body. In verse 21 it's shown to us that, that no member is to boast that their function is superior to another member. Not to think of my role as more crucial or superior to that of another brother or sister. All member, every single member, is vital to the working of the whole. That's the message. And he highlights in verse 23 and 24 how the weaker members, as we might see them, the, those that are more feeble, are singled out for special care. And we come down to verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. No schism. He's picking up the same word uh, from chapter 11, verse 18, where he spoke of divisions. No divisions in the body. There should be none. There shouldn't be division among the haves and the have-nots. And maybe at the end of that verse, in verse 25, he's actually harking back well and truly to the things that he's addressed in chapter 11 earlier on. But that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. And so he says in verse 27, Now ye, ye are the body of Christ. He puts it on them. Ye are the body of Christ and individually members of it. He's talking to the Corinthians and he's speaking to us here this morning. To rightly discern the Lord's body also involves the way that we think about the ecclesia. And of all the individual members that make up that ecclesia, our ecclesia. One version puts it as having careful regard of the Lord's body. Having careful regard of the Lord's body. The ecclesia here is not an ordinary place, is it? It's the house of the living God, where God is seen in real and tangible ways. Where God is manifest in people. Every member has been specifically put in place by God. The ecclesia is separate, it's different, it's holy. The members are all precious, they're called out ones. Each one has an important function. We need to have careful regard for one another. All the members have the same care for one another. We show care and support for each, each other in love through the highs and the lows of life. We're very conscious of people's needs and where people are at. 
Sadly, when we comp- sort of contrast with the Corinthian situation, they had lost his spirit, hadn't they? So it's quite impressive upon us in, in contrast that they had lost his spirit. And we can see where they got to. There was too much interest in me and mine rather than seeking the advantage of many. Some members were seemingly completely out of touch about the needs and the sensitivities of other members, be it the weak with their sensitivities about meat offering to uh, sort of eating meat that might have been offered to idols, or the others like the poor who came to the memorial feast with nothing to eat. They'd lost their their sense of sensitivity to the needs and, and the position of those people. Now, I'm not a member of the Cumberland Ecclesia, but I do have some sense of the intense and the enduring stress and sadness that you have faced with the loss of precious members in recent years. And I think of sisters like Sister Julie and Sister Janet, Brother Peter, Brother Andrew, Brother Bruce, just to mention some. Lost to the present world, but asleep in the Lord. And I'm sure there's been a tremendous amount of careful regard for the Lord's body in this place in recent years. As we are moved to care for our brothers and sisters experiencing painful loss. When one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. That will be true in this place. This is the spirit, isn't it? This is the spirit of rightly discerning the Lord's body, the ecclesia. Having the same care one for another. And all members have their joys and sorrows. All brothers and sisters have their trials and rewards. No matter matter whether we share the same surname or come from the same generation, we all share a common interest in the welfare, both spiritual and natural, of everyone here, of all of our fellow members here, and our precious young people and our children who are sitting with us. And not only here in this place, of course, but beyond our walls to to wherever the worldwide body of Christ is to be found. And the very mention of Lebanon and Syria and so forth this morning in the prayer is is an indication that we're thinking in this kind of way, brothers and sisters, and acting. So may we continue in this vein, brothers and sisters. May we continue in this vein. Let's be really set in our minds that we're going to assemble with purpose. We're not going to sort of beat the air and run aimlessly, as Paul talked about in chapter 9. We're not going to do that. We're going to come with purpose to this place. We're going to come together for the better, doing all to the glory of God, giving none offence to those within the ecclesia or without, seeking the profit of other people rather than my profit, looking for their advantage, that there might be many who are saved, having the same care for each other, being there for one another through joys and sorrows, striving for unity and reconciliation with each other. Brothers and sisters, it can't be too long, can it? It can't be too long before our Lord is in the earth again. I think we truly believe that. So let's ensure that we occupy well until he does come. And in the terms of verse 33, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry, one for another. That's a lovely expression to to conclude with. Tarry one for another. Wait for one another is what what it means. Wait for one another. Let's be there for each other. So that when our Lord does come, he'll find each and every single one of us, his body ready and longing to see him. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. 
you can email us at btf at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen. Thank you.